Chapter One of The House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro. Part One Jenny Comes. Chapter One The House with the Twisting Passage. Aunt Abby was a caretaker, and an excellent caretaker too, according to all accounts, her own included. Jenny had often heard her mother talk about Aunt Abby and say how fortunate she was in never being out of work, and how fortunate Uncle Nickel was in having such a capable woman as Aunt Abby for his wife. Uncle Nickel was a caretaker also, only Jenny would never have guessed this if she had not known, as he never seemed to do any caretaking, but just sat with his feet up on the kitchen range and read the newspaper and smoked a pipe. Jenny liked her Uncle Nickel because he never asked her questions like, what are nine times six? Which was Aunt Abby's favourite way of keeping Jenny occupied. Not that Jenny ever needed occupation. She could always amuse herself if left alone. But Aunt Abby never realised this. Although she did not understand Jenny, Aunt Abby was fond of the little girl in her own way, and when Jenny's mother and father went to India for two years, Aunt Abby and her sister Aunt Emma who wore long swinging earrings and lived at Putney, promised to look after Jenny between them till her parents returned to England. And so it happened that Jenny went down to stay with Aunt Abby while she was minding a beautiful old manor house in Surrey that was surrounded by gardens and orchards and little rustling woods. It was a long, low, many-windowed house. Jenny was a quiet, dreamy little girl of nine, with dark eyes and straight dark hair. Of course, she missed her mother very much at first, but gradually she settled down and began to enjoy her visit. She was allowed to play on the lawn in front of the house so long as she did not tread on any of the flower beds, and she was allowed to use the swing in the apple orchard so long as she did not touch any of the fruit. She had the run of her aunt's portion of the house, but was forbidden to go into any of the upstairs rooms or to touch any of the furniture or ornaments in case she broke something. Now and again, when Aunt Abby went to air them, Jenny was allowed to cross the threshold of one or other of the closed-up rooms, but they were not very interesting, as all the furniture was covered over with white sheets and there was nothing to see. They were dim, silent, cold rooms, and Jenny did not like them. She much preferred the queer twisting passage on the second floor that ran the length of the house. Jenny loved to play in this passage. It was not very light, but it was airy and full of funny little twists and curves. The closed doors along the sides of the passage made it all the more interesting. Jenny used to pretend that different people lived in the rooms behind these doors and soon had a name for every door she passed. For instance, she pretended that an old gentleman with white hair who played the violin and was very poor lived in one of the rooms. She called him Phil the Fiddler. Next door to him was Mr Snatcher, a greedy man with a very large black moustache and a bad temper. Jenny pretended that she disliked Mr Snatcher exceedingly, and she was always inventing punishments for him, such as making him do the work of a dustman or a drain inspector, when she pretended he got chased by enormous rats, or a sweep, or a diver, when he trod on jellyfish which stung him in spite of his diver's outfit. No matter what Mr Snatcher did, he always wore a bowler hat. Jenny couldn't imagine him without it, even when he was in bed asleep. In another of the rooms lived a lovely creature named Miss Ruby, who was a great lady and wore silk dresses always, even when she first got up in the morning. Then there were Miss Primrose, with white hair and kind eyes and very fond of children, and Black Jack, so called because of his black hair and flashing black eyes, he was a sailor, and Jenny said he had been all round the world twenty times. And Uncle Nodding, a dear old man who sat by the fire because of his rheumatics, and always had toffee in his pockets to give to Jenny, 
Jenny used to stick her tongue in her cheek and pretend to be eating his toffee whenever she talked to him. Also, there was Taramina, a dark-skinned young girl with a yellow dress and red beads round her neck, who spoke in a foreign language which no one but Jenny could understand. And there were Peter Bollin, and old Mrs Bunch, and many others of whom you will hear later on. Jenny enjoyed a wet day even more than a fine one, because on wet days she was allowed to play in the passage. One wet afternoon Jenny was walking along the twisting passage, when all of a sudden she came face to face with Miss Clare. After that she neglected Miss Ruby and Mr Snatcher and all the rest of them for a while, and played only with Miss Clare. For Miss Clare was more real than Miss Ruby, though not quite as real as Jenny herself. A half-tending person, Jenny called her, because she was a real person, though she never played along the passage as Jenny pretended she did. Indeed, although Miss Clare was alive, she was not in the old manor house at all. But her picture was, and it was this that Jenny discovered hanging on the wall at the end of the twisting passage. Miss Clare, Jenny learned afterward, was the only child of the lady who owned the manor house which Aunt Abby was minding. The pictured Miss Clare was a pretty little girl about nine years old, the same age as Jenny, with long curls and laughing eyes, dressed in a dainty white frock. In her arms she held a big wax stall. The picture, with Miss Clare's name written in the corner, fascinated Jenny, and she stood gazing admiringly at it for a long time. Jenny's eyes were wistful as she looked at Miss Clare's dainty frock and buckled shoes, and more wistful still as she looked at the doll in her arms. Then Jenny sighed and wrinkled her eyebrows up. Her eyes travelled over the picture till they met Miss Clare's laughing glance. Then Jenny smiled and kissed her hand to Miss Clare. How do you do? said Jenny. Do come and play with me, Miss Clare. Leave your doll on that chair beside you and let's play touch. Very well, Miss Jenny, Jenny answered herself in a high voice pretending it was Miss Clare. Then Jenny touched the picture crying, You're he, and ran away down the passage laughing and imagining she could hear Miss Clare's light footsteps racing after her. Up and down and up and down the passage ran Jenny and her Miss Clare, and sometimes Miss Clare was chasing Jenny, and sometimes Jenny was chasing Miss Clare. Just hark at that child, what's she running about and laughing like that for? said Aunt Abby to Uncle Nickle as she poured out a cup of tea in the kitchen. Jenny, Jenny, not so much noise there if you please. Come along down and have your tea she called from the foot of the stairs. But Jenny did not hear at once. She was just running along the passage and pretending that she saw Miss Clare's white frock whisk round the corner when she stopped suddenly in the middle of the passage and her heart gave a jump. Something white really did flap round the corner and disappear. Then the white thing flapped round the corner again and she saw that it was only a curtain blowing at an open window so she ran downstairs to tea, leaving Miss Clare to climb back into her frame. "'Whatever were you doing upstairs, child?' asked Aunt Abby. Jenny was stricken with shyness. It was impossible to tell her aunt about Miss Clare. She would not understand. "'Only running up and down the passage, Aunt Abby,' Jenny replied. "'Only running the leather off your shoes, you mean?' said Aunt Abby brusquely, then added in a kinder tone, Well, mind you don't break anything, that's all. Later on that evening, Jenny asked Uncle Nickle a few hesitating questions about Miss Clare. Uncle Nickle could give her but little information. He had heard of Miss Clare, but had never seen her. She was in London at the present time with her mother, Uncle Nickle believed. What was that Jenny was saying? A picture of Miss Clare upstairs, was there? He'd come up one day when he wasn't busy and have a look, said Uncle Nickle. And he leaned back in his chair, put his feet up on the kitchen range, and began to read his newspaper.
End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of The House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carew. Chapter Two Jenny's Miss Clare. The following day, Jenny had another game with Miss Clare and began to feel as if she had known her all her life. She was absorbed with this new playmate of hers and ran past Miss Ruby's door and Mr Snatcher's door without giving either of them a thought. Then Jenny made one or two discoveries about Miss Clare which made her seem more real than ever. One afternoon when Aunt Abby had gone to sleep on the sofa, Jenny crept upstairs and, against the rules, searched the upper floors until she found the old nursery at the top and here, after much quiet rummaging about, she found in a cupboard the doll, actually the same doll, that Miss Clare was holding in her arms in the picture. To make quite sure, Jenny carried it carefully down into the passage and compared it with the pictured doll. Yes, it was the same, no doubt about it, though it looked older and more knocked about than the one Miss Clare was holding. Jenny gazed down into the doll's staring eyes and thought they looked pathetic and lonely. So after this she would often creep away, when Aunt Abby was not looking, and steal into the old nursery and nurse the doll for a few minutes and talk to it, saying that Miss Clare hadn't forgotten it and would come home again soon. Hidden away in the nursery, she also found a pair of Miss Clare's little black slippers, they were too small for Jenny. She knew, because she tried to put them on. Another discovery was a torn exercise book with Miss Clare's name on the cover, written in large, straggling handwriting. And this disclosed to Jenny the secret that Miss Clare couldn't add up very well, and didn't know what nine times six was, which made her all the more dear to Jenny's heart. And so Jenny dreamed and weaved stories about Miss Clare, inventing all sorts of things about her manners and likes and dislikes, until she really felt she knew Miss Clare as well as she knew herself. On fine days she would take Miss Clare out into the garden, and they would take it in turns to have swings in the orchard. After having a swing herself, Jenny would get solemnly off, and, lifting up the imaginary Miss Clare, who, she always pretended, was a little smaller than herself, she would place her on the seat and stand and push the swing to and fro until Miss Clare had had a good swing, and it was Jenny's turn again. On wet days she and Miss Clare stayed indoors and played house or hide-and-seek along the passages. "'Well, I must say the child isn't much trouble,' Aunt Abby would remark to Uncle Nickel. However, she manages to amuse herself in those empty passages I can't imagine. Just listen to her now, running up and down and laughing. I never played with nothing like that when I was a child. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carew. Chapter 3 The Other Miss Clare Jenny came downstairs from a stolen visit to the old nursery one day, where she had been assuring the wax doll for the twentieth time that Miss Clare had not forgotten her, and found Aunt Abby fluttering to and fro in the kitchen in a very agitated state while Uncle Nickel was slowly getting into his best jacket and brushing his hair before the tiny cracked mirror in the scullery. As soon as Aunt Abby caught sight of Jenny, she seized hold of her arm and whisked her upstairs to her bedroom, and there Jenny had her face washed and her hair brushed and tied up with ribbon, and her clean starched pinafore put on over her best serge frock. And now go and ask your Uncle Nickel to give your shoes a rub, and be quick about it, because Miss Clare will be here any minute now, said Aunt Abby flurriedly. Miss Clare? gasped Jenny, her little face flushing crimson. 
Yes, a telegram has just come, and you mustn't get your pinafore soiled. Now mind, Miss Clare won't be staying here more than an hour. She's coming to fetch some things of hers, and I want her to see what a nice, clean, well-behaved little girl you are. Run along down now to your Uncle Nickel. I'll be down in a minute. And Aunt Abby bustled away. When she had had her shoes cleaned, Jenny made her way up to the twisting passage and looked at Miss Clare. She was feeling very excited, and somehow a little bit sad. She had never expected to meet Miss Clare really, and now she was not sure that she wanted to. Jenny was afraid, afraid of things being spoiled. Her thoughts were vague and troubled. She couldn't put them into words. She only knew she felt unhappy. Supposing she is a proud little girl after all, she thought to herself and I'd pretend that she was so glad to play with me. Aunt Abby's excited voice, calling, Jenny, Jenny, came up from below, and Jenny hurried downstairs, her heart beating rapidly. Aunt Abby and Uncle Nickel were in the hall, and just as Jenny reached it, the front door was being opened. A tall, middle-aged lady came up the front steps, a lady with cold, hard eyes and thin lips. She wore a long grey coat and a black hat with a large black feather in it. The lady stepped inside the hall and greeted Aunt Abby and Uncle Nichols, saying that she supposed they had got her telegram and that she would not be long in collecting together the things she wanted and she would have a cup of tea made for her while she went upstairs to her room. Then she swept through the hall, barely glancing at Jenny as she passed her, and went up the stairs. Aunt Abby hurried away to get the tea, and Uncle Nickel followed, glad to make himself scarce, and Jenny was left alone in the hall. She was too surprised at first to do anything but stand and gaze at the stairs up which the lady had vanished. There had been some mistake, Jenny thought. That was not Miss Clare. Her mother, perhaps, but not Miss Clare. Overhead, Jenny could hear the lady opening and shutting doors. Outside she could hear the cab horse that was waiting to take the lady back to the station, pawing the gravel path. Downstairs she could hear Aunt Abby and the clatter of cups and saucers. She felt she must find out immediately who this lady was. She must know. In a moment she was halfway up the stairs. Then suddenly her courage deserted her and she flew downstairs to the kitchen. Aunt Abby, is that Miss Clare's mother? she asked breathlessly. "'Oh, don't bother me, child. The kettle's boiling over. No, of course it isn't Miss Clare's mother. It's Miss Clare herself.' "'Miss Clare herself? Poor Jenny. She crept away into the orchard and hid until Miss Clare had gone. She felt she couldn't bear to see her again. And when she heard the cab drive away, she felt as if there were two Miss Clares inside it, her own and the other one.' I don't feel as if I can ever play with her any more now that I know what she was like afterward, Jenny thought, sobbing quietly to herself. And though she tried the next day to imagine Miss Clare out of her frame and running down the passage, she couldn't do it. The vision of a hard-voiced, cold-eyed lady came between her and the little girl in the picture. So she went away and nursed the old wax doll in the nursery for a while. Then she blew her nose and rubbed her eyes with her pink bordered handkerchief, put on her new shoes and her white cotton gloves, and went to pay a call on her imaginary Miss Ruby. She found the lovely creature dressed in pale blue silk, though it was only ten o'clock in the morning, and as Jenny listened to Miss Ruby's story of the terrible fits of temper Mr Snatcher had had lately, and while she invented three new punishments for him, she began to feel better and almost happy again. I don't think I'll play with any more half-tending people. Really tending people are much nicer, and I like you best, Miss Ruby, she confided to that beautiful maiden. Better than Miss Clare, because Miss Clare's grown up all different, and when you grow up, Miss Ruby, you are not going to be different at all. And besides, you can't grow up without my knowing, she added. But this is where Jenny was mistaken curiously mistaken, for, a few days later, she was sent away to stay with Aunt Emma, 
who wore swinging earrings, you remember, and lived at Putney. And when she returned to Anne Tebby at the end of a couple of months, she found that a startling change had taken place in her absence. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of the House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carew. Chapter Four The Lighted Windows. When Jenny had left for Aunt Emma's, it had been a cold, rainy evening, and she had looked back, with tears in her eyes, at the old manor house with its rows of dark windows, behind which lived Miss Ruby and Uncle Nodding, and all the rest of her pretending people. And she had felt as if she were leaving behind all her friends. If only she could have taken one of them with her to Putney! but there was no room for Miss Ruby or any of them in Aunt Emma's little house, which smelled of new paint and linoleum, and had small spidery-legged tables full of knick-knacks all about the rooms. Aunt Emma was always bumping into these tables and knocking them over, but she never seemed to mind. She would merely write whichever table she had upset, and call Jenny to pick up all the scattered ornaments and photograph frames, and arrange them once more in their places. Jenny did try once to pretend that Miss Ruby had come on a visit to Putney, but it was not a success. Aunt Emma's laugh got in the way. Jenny could never be alone at Aunt Emma's, however much she wanted to be. It seemed as if Aunt Emma was all the time bumping into her thoughts and scattering them and all the pretendings, just as she scattered all the ornaments off the little tables. Even at night time Jenny was not alone. She slept in Aunt Emma's room, and Aunt Emma always went to bed early and talked to her until Jenny fell asleep. Aunt Emma was very kind-hearted, but Jenny was not really happy with her. There seemed always to be a fuss going on about something or other. If it wasn't the doings of the grocer's boy that Aunt Emma talked about to Jenny, it was the doings of the people next door, or the extravagant ways of Aunt Emma's charwoman. Aunt Emma always told a story three times over. The first time, as soon as she got to the end, she would say, Yes, and that's how it was, and begin all over again. The third time she would tell it in bits, recalling a sentence here and there and repeating the middle part first, perhaps, and then jumping back to the beginning. But she always told it three times, and Jenny was expected to sit and listen politely and laugh in the right places every time. All this was rather trying to Jenny when she was longing to be racing up and down the long passage, calling on Miss Ruby and Mr. Snatcher, or hushing Miss Clare's old doll to sleep in the deserted nursery. Whenever Jenny thought of Miss Clare, a dreadful heavy feeling seemed to get inside her, until she tried not to remember the Miss Clare in the black feathered hat who came to the house that day, but thought only of the little girl in the picture. And gradually there grew up in Jenny's mind two separate Miss Clares, her own and the other one. The other one being a strange grown-up who was not really Miss Clare at all, but a person who unfortunately happened to have the same name. One morning Aunt Emma said at breakfast, "'Here's a letter from your Aunt Abby. "'You're to go back tomorrow, my dear.' "'Jenny tried hard not to show how glad she was to hear this, "'because she did not want to hurt Aunt Emma's feelings. "'All the same, she could hardly sit still a moment, "'and tomorrow seemed a long way off. "'She counted up how many hours would have to pass "'before she would actually be in the train on her way back to Miss Ruby, "'and she put the numbers down on a piece of paper,' and crossed one off every time Aunt Emma's dining-room clock struck. Of course, she took care not to let Aunt Emma see what she was doing, and when, at the end, goodbyes were said, she put her arms very tightly round Aunt Emma's neck, and felt suddenly remorseful that she was not more sorry to go. She was, in fact, so happy to be going back to Miss Ruby that she felt she quite loved Aunt Emma. And Aunt Emma said, what an affectionate little thing it is! And never guessed that Jenny had missed anything in the little furniture-crowded house at Putney. 
It was quite dark when Jenny arrived at the gate of the old manor house. The village postmistress, a friend of Aunt Abby's, who happened to be in London that day, had taken charge of Jenny and brought her from Aunt Emma's back to Aunt Abby. As they came to the gate, Jenny, who had been chatting all the way from the station, fell suddenly silent. She looked up at her dear old house with its many windows, but somehow it seemed different. What had happened? Her eyes travelled from one window to another, and she saw that a light gleamed from every one. No longer were they dark and desolate looking. It was as if Miss Ruby and Mr Snatcher and Uncle Nodding and all of them had lit up their windows to welcome her home. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of the House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro. Chapter Five What Happened While Jenny Was Away? Jenny gazed fascinated at the windows as she walked up the broad gravel path, but when she reached the house, her attention was switched off on to many other surprising things. A trim maid servant in cap and apron opened the door, and inside Aunt Abby's kitchen a number of aproned people passed to and fro. Aunt Abby herself had changed. No longer did she wear her faded black serge dress with the hooks that were always done up in the wrong eyes. She was dressed in a new stiff alpaca dress and wore a little black silk apron edged with black lace that Jenny had never seen before. Aunt Abby kissed Jenny affectionately on both cheeks and then turned to speak to the postmistress. It did not seem to occur to anybody that an explanation to Jenny was necessary, although everything seemed to be changed. The quiet, dimly lit house that had echoed to the sound of Jenny's pattering feet was humming with voices and the footsteps of people. And everywhere there were lights burning. Jenny looked around her in wonder. Then she caught sight of Uncle Nickel. He was sitting with his feet up on the kitchen range reading the newspaper. Uncle Nickel seemed to be the only thing in the house that had not altered. He looked as if he had not moved an inch since Jenny left him two months ago. She flew across to him and clasped him round the neck. "'Uncle Nickel, what has happened?' she cried. "Eh." "'Bless my soul if it isn't little Jenny,' said Uncle Nickel, bringing his feet down to the ground and sitting upright in his chair. "'I never heard you come in.' "'Uncle Nickel, do tell me, please, please.' Jenny always said two pleases when she was extra excited. "'What has happened? I can't understand.' Jenny had thought for a moment that it might be that the family had returned. But she knew that if it was the family, Miss Clare's family, who had come back to their house, Aunt Abby would not have been there. Aunt Abby always left before a family returned. Eh? said Uncle Nickel. Can't understand what, my dear. Oh, I see. Yes, of course. Everything looks all different, said Jenny. Everything is all different answered Uncle Nickel. A crowd of strangers in my kitchen here, so that I can't read my newspaper in peace, and kettles of water nearly boiling over me every minute. But I'm not going to shift for any of them. Whose kitchen is it, anyhow's? That's what I want to know. And Uncle Nickel glared resentfully over the top of his spectacles at the hurrying figures around him. But it isn't the family come back, is it, Uncle Nickel? inquired Jenny. I ought to sit in her new room, the housekeeper's room, so your Aunt Abby says, to keep up me dignity like, Jenny, my dear, Uncle Nickel continued to air his grievance. But I'm used to this kitchen, and I likes what I'm used to. Besides, there's a place on the corner of this range which just seems to fit the heels of my boots. So here I am, and here I stays said Uncle Nickel stubbornly. But, Uncle, 
I knew what it would be when your Aunt Tabby took on this housekeeping job, said Uncle Nickel. Stick to caretaking was my advice. Caretakers we always have been, and caretakers we always will be. That's what my advice was. But no, nothing would suit your Aunt Tabby, but she must have a turn at this new fandangle. Now I'm used to caretaking, and I likes what I'm used to. But this housekeeping idea, with all them strangers upstairs... Strangers? echoed Jenny. Uncle Nickle brought his gaze to bear on Jenny in silence for a moment. Of course, he said. Didn't I explain? Oh, well, it's like this, Jenny, my dear. The people what owned this house had a death in their family, and the persons what came into possession of this house decided, as they wouldn't be using it themselves for some while, to open it up and use it in a special way, as a sort of rest cure, a rest home, I mean, for certain needy friends and acquaintances, as you might say. See how I mean, Jenny? Anyways, what has happened is this. Most of the rooms upstairs has been opened up, and a staff of servants, all these encumbrances, Uncle Nickel glared round resentfully once again. A staff of servants, I say, has been engaged by your Aunt Abby, who herself has accepted the job of managing a housekeeper here. And in the rooms upstairs are staying people who have been sent here for a sort of rest and holiday. Oh, said Jenny. But who was the death in the family, Uncle Nickel? Not Miss Cl Uncle Nickel knocked his pipe on the bars of the grate and started to refill it. Old Sir Henry, ninety-four years of age, he said solemnly, putting his feet up on the kitchen range again. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of the House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro. Chapter Six A Strange Discovery. After supper, which they had in Aunt Abby's new sitting room, Aunt Abby took Jenny by the hand and prepared to lead her upstairs to bed. All the place has been so altered and changed about, Jenny, she said. I must show you your new bedroom. Whatever has your Aunt Emma been doing to your hair, child? It looks a regular mop. She didn't brush it off and I'll be bound. We shall have to tie it up out of your eyes. Come along now. Say good night to your Uncle Nickel. Jenny, clinging nervously to Aunt Abby's hand, went up the stairs, glancing from side to side as she went, taking note of the changes that had come over the old house in her absence. All the dark, sleepy corridors were awake now, and from behind the closed doors they passed came sounds of voices. There were soft carpets all the way up the stairs and gleaming stair rods. As they passed a door on the second floor, the first along the twisting passage, where Jenny's Miss Primrose was supposed to live, it opened, and a gentle-faced elderly lady came out. Aunt Abby immediately stopped and made a funny little movement, something like a curtsy. "'Oh, Miss Lane,' she said, "'those cases of soda water have arrived all right. There had been a mistake, just as you thought.' Miss Lane inclined her head and smiled, looking down at Jenny. "'Is this?' she began. "'My little niece Jenny that I told you about, ma'am,' said Aunt Abby. "'Jenny, say how do you do to the lady?' But before Jenny could speak, Miss Lane had put her hands on the little girl's shoulders and had bent down and kissed her. "'I'm glad to see you, dear,' she said. And as she kissed her, Jenny felt that she had known this lady for a long time. This could not be their first meeting, surely.' thought Jenny. There seemed something vaguely familiar about the lady's voice and the way she moved her head. Where had she seen her before? Jenny wondered. With solemn, puzzled eyes, she gazed up at the kind, smiling face above her. Then suddenly Jenny recognised her. It was Miss Primrose. Just as Jenny had imagined her, here she was, as if she had come to life. 
Miss Primrose had been elderly, white-haired, gentle and kind, with the same look in her eyes that this lady had. Jenny had even imagined Miss Primrose wearing a little lace cap, like the cap the lady standing before her was wearing. But she had not thought of the white silk shawl that lay across Miss Lane's shoulders. Miss Lane? They might call her Miss Lane, but of course that wasn't her real name. Jenny felt sure of that. "'You will let Jenny come up and see me in the morning, won't you?' the lady said to Anne Tabby. "'I've got some pictures she might like to look at.' "'Oh, certainly, of course. Only too pleased, ma'am, if it won't be worrying you to have her,' replied Anne Tabby. "'Children never worry me,' said the lady, smiling down into Jenny's eyes. "'I love them.' Still holding Jenny's hand, Aunt Abby moved on, and the next minute they were passing Miss Ruby's door. Jenny's heart began to beat rapidly, but nothing happened. As they mounted the next flight of stairs, Aunt Abby said, "'Well, I don't know, but Miss Lane seems to have taken a fancy to you, and that's nice for you, Jenny, because she is the manageress, or hostess as they call her, of the whole house.' "'You'll have to be a good girl, though, and not make a noise or anything. "'I mustn't have any complaints about you. "'You understand now what I say, don't you?' "'Yes, Aunt Abby,' said Jenny quietly. "'On the next landing they passed the door of Jenny's old bedroom "'and went further along the corridor. "'Here we are,' said Aunt Abby. "'Although you're moved, you'll be next door to my room "'just the same as you used to be.' "'They had stopped outside the door of the old nursery.' "'Oh, Aunt Abby!' Jenny gasped. "'What's the matter now?' asked Aunt Abby, a little short of breath after climbing all the stairs. But Jenny could not speak. Her eyes were shining. "'I suppose you're surprised at having such a big room all to yourself, eh?' said Aunt Abby. Jenny nodded. "'Well, it was the only room left, so we was obliged to put your bed up in here. There's been no time to see to the rest of the room, so we've had to leave it. "'But it has been a nursery, and it'll do very well for you, I dare say, "'when it's put to rights later on.' "'Jenny listened to Aunt Abby's talk in a kind of dream "'while her aunt helped her to get ready for bed. "'Now go to sleep like a good girl, "'and there's nothing to be frightened of up here "'because the house is full of people, "'and I'll be up before long, in the next room. "'Here's a candle and matches and a drink of water, "'but don't light the candle unless you can help it, Jenny.' "'Aunt Abby cautioned her. "'Good night, Aunt Abby,' said Jenny. "'And, oh, Aunt Abby, I'm so glad to be back.' "'Bless the child,' said Aunt Abby. "'Well, be a good girl, that's all.' And she went away down the stairs. Jenny lay still until Aunt Abby's descending footsteps had died away, and then she sat up in bed with a jerk. The pale light from the moon streaming in through the window enabled her to see dimly round the room. Except for her bed, a strip of matting, and a chest of drawers with a looking-glass standing on the top of it, new arrivals, the old nursery had not changed. Nobody had had time to bother with it. Slipping out of bed, Jenny crossed over to the cupboard near the window and opened the door. Inside, on the top shelf, just where she had left it, was Miss Clare's old doll. Jenny brought it out, kissed it, looked for a moment at its pathetic eyes, then kissed it again. "'Never mind,' she said. "'I'll be here to take care of you now.' She carried the doll over to the bed, tucked it snugly inside with its head comfortably on the pillow, and then whispered, "'Wait here just a minute, dear. I'll be back directly, but I must just go and find out.' The doll gazed sadly up at the ceiling while Jenny, her eyes round and very bright, put on her bedroom slippers, opened the bedroom door softly, and crept out into the passage. Along the passage and down the stairs she went, moving quickly and noiselessly, and on the alert herself for the slightest sound. Outside Miss Ruby's door she stopped. Someone was moving about inside. While Jenny hesitated, she heard someone come up close to the other side of the door of Miss Ruby's room. Jenny turned and ran quickly up the stairs and crouched behind some long window curtains on the landing above. From below came the sound of a door opening. Then all was quiet. 
After waiting a while, Jenny stole out of her hiding place and peeped over the banisters. She could see down into the passage with its row of doors on either side. Miss Ruby's door was standing wide open. Slowly, cautiously, Jenny crept down several stairs again. A little further, and then, by crouching down, she found she could see right into the room. By the table, reading a letter, was standing a beautiful creature with fair curly hair, dressed in a magnificent pink silk frock. Jenny gazed spellbound. Then she turned and fled up the stairs and along the passage to her own room and shut herself in. It is, it is, it is, it's Miss Ruby, she said over and over again to herself, almost crying with excitement. She's come alive, really and truly alive. Oh, whatever shall I do? Miss Ruby, Miss Ruby, but I thought I should find you. Directly I saw Miss Primrose. Jenny leapt onto the bed and, sitting with her hands clasped round her knees and her chin resting on the top of one knee, tried to get her thoughts straightened out. She felt bewildered. If Miss Ruby and Miss Primrose had come to life in this mysterious manner, Jenny thought, then Mr Snatcher and Uncle Nodding and Black Jack and all the rest of them had probably come alive too and she would find them waiting down there behind their doors in the long twisting passage. I shall find them all, I know I shall, said Jenny. I feel I shall. But how had it all happened? she kept asking herself. To this she could find no answer. Of course, Aunt Abby might call these people by names such as Miss Lane, but that did not matter in the least. They would not be their real names that Aunt Abby called them by. Jenny felt sure of that. Oh, I shall never be able to go to sleep tonight, thought Jenny. I wish it was tomorrow now, so that I could go down and find all the others. And then she remembered Miss Clare, and her disappointment when Miss Clare came alive. Was she going to be sorry that Miss Ruby and all of them had come alive, too? Miss Clare's grown up all different, and when you grow up, Miss Ruby, you are not going to be different at all. Besides, you can't grow up without my knowing, Jenny had once said to that beautiful maiden. But Miss Ruby had come alive without Jenny's permission, so what was to prevent her being all different and not a bit like the Miss Ruby of Jenny's imagination? She looks exactly as she ought to. Oh, she must be like my Miss Ruby, said Jenny to herself. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of The House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb. The Slipperfox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro. Chapter 7 the people behind the doors. And the most surprising thing was that the lovely being in the pink silk dress did turn out to be like Jenny's Miss Ruby. The next day, after breakfast, Jenny managed to see her again, and watched her as she moved with just Miss Ruby's movements, and talked in just Miss Ruby's voice, and laughed with a little rippling laugh, just as Miss Ruby ought to have done. At least, as far as Jenny could remember, this fair maiden was like her Miss Ruby. But she got the two Miss Rubies so mixed up in her mind before the day was out that she found it difficult to decide what things were done by the imaginary Miss Ruby that the live one did not do, and what things the live Miss Ruby did that the imaginary one ought to have done. At all events, here was Miss Ruby right enough, and here was Miss Primrose, and it did not take Jenny long to discover Uncle Nodding, Black Jack, old Mrs Bunch, Peter Bollin, and many more of them. She found these people living behind the doors in the long, twisting passage, just as she had thought she would. People strangely like those of her imagination. How had it happened? Jenny would ask herself this question ten times a day, trying to find some way of explaining matters but she always had to give it up in the end and shake her head. It was fortunate that Miss Lane, or Miss Primrose as we must call her, had taken such a liking to Jenny. 
Through this, Jenny was soon able to make friends with the occupants of the various rooms, and afterward was often in the company of one or other of her own people, as she called them to herself. From the very first she felt at home with these folk, just as they, in their turn, seemed to feel on easy terms with her. There seemed to be an understanding between Jenny and these grown-ups, but neither she nor they ever referred to the matter in any way. Jenny had a feeling that she might spoil things if she spoke, so she kept silent. The only person that Jenny could not find, much to her regret, was Mr Snatcher. She looked for him in every fresh room that she entered, but she looked in vain. No bad-tempered man with a big black moustache was living under the roof of the manor house. And then one day she did find him. But you will hear all about that later on. At present, having explained how Jenny came to the old manor house and found her pretending people, and how these pretending people came alive, I want to tell you next what Miss Primrose and Uncle Nodding and Miss Ruby and Phil the Fiddler, who was exactly like himself, only he played a flute instead of a violin, and Black Jack and all the rest of them told Jenny when she went to tea in their rooms. Of course, all these people had different names, according to Aunt Abby, but we shall call them by the names that Jenny gave them. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro Part 2 Jenny in the Twisting Passage Chapter 8 Miss Primrose's Story When Jenny went to tea with Miss Primrose, she was shown two pictures. One was of a queer little creature, something like a frog. That is the Jerry Frog, said Miss Primrose. The other was of a tree such as Jenny had never seen before. A magic tree, explained Miss Primrose. "'Sit down on this hassock by the fire, Jenny, and toast the buns, "'and I'll tell you how we made it, and what became of the jerry frog.' "'The Magic Tree "'Jerry is a very small boy who believes in fairies and witches, "'and who once saw Father Christmas moving through a crowd outside a big toy shop. Also, he is my nephew, and has brown curly hair, and he's going to be a pirate when he grows up. A little while ago he came to spend a couple of days with me, and immediately on his arrival he told me of the wonderful idea that had come to him while he was eating bananas in the train. I wonder no one has ever thought of it before, Aunt, he said solemnly. But of course it may need a little magic, and it isn't everyone who knows magic, is it? Of course it isn't everyone who knows magic, but Jerry and I happen to know quite a lot, and once Jerry made a fairy, which I keep locked up in a little box on my dressing table. Perhaps one day I'll tell you how he made it, and then you can try to make one for yourself. I think we learnt most of the magic in my garden. It is a wonderful place, half wild and smothered with flowers, and hidden from the outside world by tall whispering trees and thick silent bushes, and there is a little dell in one corner of it with a pool. When the moon shines in the water and the dark trees rustle around us, Jerry and I have some queer adventures in the garden. After he had told me his idea, and we had discussed it together, I got my purse, and we went out into the garden and down to the dell. He knelt down by the pool and dug a hole with his left hand. It had to be his left hand, that was part of the magic. And then I knelt down and, dipping a penny in the water, placed it carefully in the hole with my left hand and covered it with soil. Then we said some magic words and waved our arms over the spot, put a stick to mark the place, and walked backward into the house. This was another part of the magic. Nothing happened all that day, though we paid repeated visits to the dell and gazed long and earnestly at the stick. 
So that night, when I went up to bed, I unlocked the box on my dressing table, took out the fairy, and told her about it. She shook her head doubtfully, and said she feared it would need a great deal of magic, but she would see what could be done. Jerry and I ran down to the dell early the next morning, and found, to our intense joy and amazement, that the fairy and our magic words had succeeded. Where the little stick had been the previous evening, now stood a small, sturdy tree, and growing on the branches were a score of brown pennies. A penny tree, that's what we had made. Jerry was wild with delight, and wished he hadn't been going home that evening, because he was eager to try more magic in the garden, and talked of growing a sixpenny tree and other wonderful things. "'Isn't it a pity that the people at the place, the place, you know, aunt, where they make money?' said Jerry. "'I know,' I said. "'The mint.' "'Oh, yes,' said Jerry. "'Well, isn't it a pity that they don't know enough magic to grow penny trees? "'It would save them ever such a lot of work, wouldn't it?' "'At first we thought of writing to the people at the mint.' But after talking the matter over, Jerry and I decided that it would not be much use, because even if we told them the magic bit, they haven't all got ants who have a garden like mine. Besides, it isn't everyone who has a fairy locked up in a box on the dressing table. And without the fairy, even the magic that Jerry and I know would be useless. It was during Jerry's next visit to me that the incident of the Jerry Frog occurred. We were sitting in the garden one evening, listening to the tall trees whispering above our heads, when Jerry turned to me and said, Do you know, Aunt, I shouldn't be at all surprised if something awfully magic happened in a few minutes. I feel so kind of funny. He paused, then continued in a hoarse whisper, Like as if I might be suddenly changed into, into a, a frog or something. Ah! I said. That comes of putting your shoes on the wrong feet this morning. I knew something would happen when you did that. Yes, I expect it's that, said Jerry resignedly. It'll be rather awkward if it is a frog, won't it? I said. I don't know frog language, and I shan't be able to tell you when it's bedtime. Frogs don't go to bed the same time as little boys do said Jerry. Oh no, I suppose they don't, so it won't matter very much. And I shan't need to tell you when supper's ready. Frogs only eat snails and worms and things like that, don't they? Jerry looked at me thoughtfully. Of course, I might be able to understand ordinary language, he said after a moment. Mightn't I? You could just try ant in case, and I might be able to answer. Enchanted frogs can sometimes, you know. Of course, I said. I'd forgotten. Perhaps you're tired, Aunt, he suggested. Now I come to think of it, I am rather sleepy, I replied, yawning. I'd like to have a little doze, if you don't mind, and... <gasps> I yawned again and fell immediately into a deep sleep. When I woke up about half a minute later, I saw that Anna, the maid, had lit the red lamp in the dining room. Its warm glow streamed softly through the open French windows down the flight of stone steps to my feet. I sat up in my chair and glanced around me. Jerry had disappeared. On the stone steps in front of me, where he had been sitting, was a large green frog, gazing at me with bulging eyes. I gasped. Good evening, Jerry, I said politely. Good evening, said a high, whispery voice. How do you like being a frog? I asked. Can you understand me? Yes, replied the high voice. I like it very well, thank you. Your voice has changed remarkably. It always changes when you're a frog, the voice explained. How interesting, I said. 
Do you find the other people in Frogland nice? Very nice indeed, came the answer. That's a good thing. I suppose you haven't had time to try any snails yet, have you? No, said the voice. I say, aunt, you might put a glass of milk out on the steps at supper time, in case I don't like snails just at first. I'll, I'll get used to them, you know. Very well, I said. I'm just going indoors now. I can see that Anna has finished setting the table. I got up and went in by the side door so as not to disturb the jerry frog on the steps. There was Jerry's favourite pudding for supper, so I put some on a plate, poured out a glass of milk, and took both outside and placed them on the steps. There's your favourite pudding tonight, I said to the jerry frog, so I thought you might like a bit. The high voice thanked me very much, and I went indoors and left the jerry frog and its supper out in the dark garden with the whispery trees. Five minutes later, the plate and the glass were empty, and the high voice informed me that it would like a little more pudding. I took out a little more pudding, and was just sitting down to my own supper again, when it struck me that the jerry frog might also like another glass of milk. I crossed to the window, then stopped, and gave a cry of astonishment. There, on the bottom step, with the plate in his hand, was Jerry. He started. Oh, oh, he stammered. Oh, they've turned me back suddenly, aunt, and I thought I'd better come in at once. It's, it's nearly bedtime, isn't it? He came up the steps, then glanced quickly behind him as if he had forgotten something. Down on the bottom step, something moved. What a lot of leaves there are blowing about the steps tonight, I said. You must sweep them off in the morning, Jerry. Jerry turned and smiled up at me, clasping my arm lovingly. Come in and finish your supper, aunt, he coaxed. Oh, I'm so glad they've turned me back again. He drew me gently inside the room as he spoke. I'm sure I never should have got used to snails. They look so big and horny when you're as little as a frog. And now, could I have just one teeny little bit more pudding, do you think, Aunt, please? Magic and unmagicking seems to make you so hungry somehow. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of the House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro. Chapter Nine Black Jack's Story. Hello, shipmate, cried Black Jack. Come aboard, me hearty. All hands on deck. And how are we this evening? He beamed at Jenny as the little girl appeared at his open door. Jack, my lad? he went on, addressing himself. Can't you find a petment for the company? Aha, here we are. Now you just try one of these, shipmate, and if they're not the best petments you've ever struck, well, my name's not by no manner of means what it is. He produced a crumpled paper bag from one of his pockets and held it out to Jenny. She advanced hesitatingly into the room and took a peppermint from the bag. Thank you very much, she said and as she tasted it, they're lovely. And what are we doing with ourselves this evening, shipmate? inquired Black Jack. Nothing particular, said Jenny. Same here, grinned Black Jack. Well, it's clear to me that a ship's company has got nothing particular to do this evening. I might as well tell that tale I promised, eh? Oh, please, if you would, said Jenny eagerly. It was what she had been hoping for when she came past the door. Delighted, said Black Jack. Only I shall make a bit of noise, I warn you. I can't tell a tale without doing the actions, if you know what I mean. So if I kick the coal bucket over, and scatter the fire irons, and thump the table and tear the window curtains down, you mustn't be surprised. It's the only way I can tell a story. Jenny's smiling little face grew serious. 
She wouldn't mind, of course, if Black Jack tore the window curtains down. But what would Aunt Abby say? Hark at the rain beating against the window, said Black Jack. Just the right sort of night for the tale I'm going to tell you. Here, have another pet mint and gather round the fire. And me the poker, matey, and I'll soon make it blaze up. That's better. And now I'll begin. The Tattooed Man Twenty years ago, on just such another night as this, the wind moaning and howling and the rain coming down in torrents, I was walking along a little back street in Dieppe. That's in France, shipmate, you know. On my way down to the quay, to my ship. I'd been sent ashore on an errand, and was hurrying back as I'd heard a clock strike eight and my ship was due to start at the half hour. I stepped into the doorway of what I took to be an empty shop for a moment to light a cigarette. As the match flared, I happened to look up and straight through the glass door of the shop. Inside, by the empty, dusty counter, was sitting a man, quite still and all alone. I was taken aback. What in the world of wonders is he doing in there? I thought to myself, but said nothing and my match went out. I struck another match and gave a start as I saw that the man had got up and come close to the other side of the glass door and was glaring through at me. Jack, I thought to myself, this is no place for you. I should make myself scarce, my lad, if I was you. Which I did. But I hadn't gone more than a hundred yards when I heard someone running after me, and the next moment a hand caught hold of my arm. Here Black Jack caught hold of a handful of red plush tablecloth and slid it along so that it hung half off the table. I wheeled round and saw by the light of a baker's shop window that it was the man who had just been looking at me through the glass doors. I faced him squarely. He was an ugly man, with a cruel thin mouth and a red mark right across one cheek, as if he had been in a fight, I thought. He was a bit out of breath with running. Are you going by that ship to England? He nodded toward the quay. I told him I was. You're just the man I want, he said hurriedly, looking over his shoulder and then back at me again. It's fate you're stopping in that doorway just when... But never mind that. Do you want to earn twenty golden sovereigns for yourself without any trouble? He asked in a quick, bewildered sort of way. He could see how I felt about it by the way my mouth dropped open in surprise. He put his hand in his pocket and drew out some gold pieces. When you reach the other side, will you get any leave? He asked anxiously. I nodded. We've just finished a long voyage, I said. It was only an accident we called in here. I shall get leave on the other side. Good, good, he said. Then you will have no difficulty in doing what I ask of you. All I want you to do is to take this small packet, he went on, and when you get to England, deliver it with your own hands to the person whose name and address is written on the outside, only it must be delivered without fail before the end of this month. I will give you plenty of money to pay expenses, but you must promise me on your word of honour as a British sailor. Of course this touched me, and he knew it would, the wily old bird that he was. So I gave him my solemn word of honour as a British sailor that I would deliver the packet safely to the man whose name was written outside it. You must not part with it to anyone but this man. I must make sure that only he gets it, otherwise I might as well send it through the post. You may think it odd that I ask you, a stranger, the ugly man continued, but it is my only chance and the matter is very urgent. He glanced quickly over his shoulder again. Then he went on, speaking rapidly, to tell me how I should recognise the man to whom I was to give the packet. You cannot fail to find him at the address on the packet, and you cannot fail to recognise him because he has the head of a parrot tattooed on the back of his left hand, he said. You know what tattoo marks are, don't you, shipmate? It's a sort of picture drawn, or rather pricked, onto the skin of your arm or hand, or anywhere you like, with a blue ink or dye. And it won't ever come off, so that you might keep on washing your hands, if they were tattooed, for a hundred years, and it would only be a waste of soap. The tattoo marks would still be there at the end. Well, 
my ugly friend counted out twenty golden sovereigns into the palm of his hand and i thought to myself jack my lad twenty sovereigns is twenty sovereigns and not to be sneezed at as the saying is and though i didn't like the look of the man there can be no harm in doing him this little service i thought it seemed simple enough so i took the packet and i took the twenty sovereigns and I gave him my word of honour again, and I turned away. But just as he was going, he caught me suddenly by the arm. Black Jack leant forward and made a sudden grab at the back of a chair near him, which gave Jenny a jump. And thrusting his ugly face close to mine, he said, If you don't keep your word, I shall know. And then, look out for yourself, your life won't be worth a brass farthing. There was such a threatening note in his voice and such an evil look in his eye that, well, I tell you, shipmate, my legs felt all at once as if they were made of jelly. They felt all a shake round the knees. Then, before I could move or say a word, he had gone. I made my way down to the quay, feeling a bit muddled like, and got aboard my ship just in time, and we were soon under way for the English coast. At the first opportunity I got, I looked at the name and address on the packet. Mr. Silas Trudge at the Golden Peacock Inn, Lyme Regis, Dorset, I read. Dorset, I said to myself. That's a tidy stretch from London, Jack, my lad. My old folk live just on the outskirts of London, at High Barnet. However, I'd given my word, so there was no help for it but to go. Yet that night, during the crossing over, which was very rough and stormy, I kept thinking of the stranger with the ugly face and queer manner, and I wished I hadn't promised to do what he wanted. I got the same kind of feeling you get when you guess there's a bit of bad luck awaiting round the corner for you. Well, anyway, shipmate, after we had landed in England and I had been home to my old mother for a couple of days, I went off one morning down to Dorsetshire. I thought I'd better go before I spent all my money and hadn't got the fare left. It was late afternoon and getting dusk when I got to Lyme Regis, which is a quaint little seacoast place with streets going all up and down hill and out into the sea, instead of a pier, runs a long, curved sort of wall, very wide across, and built all of stonework. This is called the Cobb. I found the Golden Peacock Inn down on the front, not far from the land end of the Cobb. It was a neat little inn with cheery curtains of a golden yellow colour at the windows. I walked past once or twice as if taking a stroll, and then, when I'd got over feeling a bit nervous, I went in and sat down and ordered something to drink. There was only one other person in there having a drink, and he was a big, thick-set man with a dark skin and big black moustache, and with one hand and arm bound up in a sling. He was sitting on a low wooden bench by a roaring fire. I gave him good evening, and he nodded to me, but did not speak. So I waited till my drink appeared, and then I said to the landlord, I'm a stranger in these parts, matey, just back from China, and I've come down here to find a man named Silas Trudge. Could you oblige me by telling me where I shall find him? The man on the bench looked up immediately, and before the landlord could reply, he said, Silas Trudge, did you say? Well, you've had your journey for nothing. You won't find him. He's dead. Dead? I echoed stupidly, looking from the man to the landlord. The landlord pursed up his lips and gravely nodded his head. Then he narrowed his eyes in a queer way. "'Tell him about Trudge,' said the landlord, looking not at me, but at the other man. The man on the bench cleared his throat. "'Trudge was uh, drowned three weeks ago, just off the coast here. His boat went down.' I was silent. I did not know what to say nor what to do. I knew him well, the man went on, and if there is anything I can do for you, if there is any message you had for him, perhaps I can help you. Trudge and me was great friends, weren't we? He turned to the landlord. None better, said the landlord. 
I hesitated. What ought I to do? I had been told not to give the packet to anyone but Silas Trudge himself, but I had never thought of his being dead. What ought I to do? I looked up and found the man and the landlord watching me closely. Hello, Jack, I said to myself. Steady on, my lad, there's something fishy here. And I decided suddenly that I would trust neither of them, for the moment at any rate. An idea had flashed into my head. A Silas Trudge was dead. I would find out what was inside the packet before confiding in his friend. It might be to my advantage to know what the packet contained. I searched about in my mind for a likely story to tell the two men who were waiting for me to speak. "'Has Silas Trudge got any near relatives living?' I asked cautiously. "'None at all,' said the man on the bench. "'I'm what you might call his nearest, being his best friend.' "'Oh, well,' I said, trying to look very simple. "'I might as well tell you. "'It seems to me to be nothing particular, "'only a message that an old friend sent him, "'a friend in London. "'As I happened to be passing through Lyme Regis, "'I undertook to look him up and tell him.' "'The man fidgeted uneasily in his seat. "'A friend in London?' he said. "'I wonder if I know him.' I know most of Trudge's friends. I was beginning to get into an hole, but once having started the story I was bound to finish it. I cast about in my mind for some person whom this friend of Trudge's would be unlikely to know. Having recently had a good deal to do with Chinaman, I fixed on one of those. His name is Ching, I began. The man on the bench turned very white, and I saw that his hand was shaking a bit. He gazed over my head at the landlord, who I think must have made some sign to him as the man turned suddenly to me. "'What was the message?' he asked quietly. I could feel that I'd got on to dangerous ground and heartily wished I had never started the story. "'You see what comes of telling one lie, shipmate. You have to go on telling more to hide the first one and cover it up. It isn't worth it. You take my word for it. My troubles began from the minute I told that first lie. The message, I said, getting a bit scared at the expression on his face, was simply this. Tell him I'm ready. I was rather proud of myself for a moment for thinking of something so easy, but the next moment my pride gave way to astonishment at the queer glance the man gave me. Ready for what? he inquired in a calm voice. That's all the message, that's all I know, I said. Well, I can't make head nor tail of it. It's evidently some little business of trudges that I know nothing about. I'm sorry, I can't be of use to you after all, said the man. Was I mistaken, or was that an amused gleam in his eye? I had a feeling that the fellow was actually laughing at me. But why? What had I said? Had he seen through me, and guessed I was merely trying to put him off the scent? I felt very puzzled and a bit worried. After this, the man, who told me his name was Bruff, got very friendly, and wanted me to keep on having more to drink. He suggested that I stayed the night at the Golden Peacock. But I did not like the narrowed eyes of the landlord, so I told one more lie, and said I had friends at Charmouth, which was the next village. Bruff seemed loath to let me go and did his best to detain me as long as possible. But at length I got away after bidding him and the landlord a friendly good night. I mentioned as I shook hands with Bruff that I was sorry to see he had hurt his other hand and arm. It was a mere nothing, he said, a slight sprain. It would soon be well again. Once outside, I started briskly off in the direction of Charmouth. Not that I wanted to go there, but I was obliged to make a pretense of going that way as I was supposed to have friends in that town. I walked quickly past the little houses by the seafront and, turning inland, took the Charmouth Road. At the first inn I came to, I went in and inquired if they had a room for the night. Fortunately, they had, so I went straight up to my room 
locked myself in, and by the light of a couple of candles that stood on the dressing-table, proceeded to examine the packet I had been carrying about for the last few days. The packet was carefully done up in thick white paper and sealed with red sealing-wax in all sorts of unexpected places on the back and on the front. "'Steady, Jack, my lad,' I said. "'If once you break these seals—' I sat and considered for a while. It was no concern of mine. Better leave it alone. I might learn something I didn't want to know if I opened this packet. On the other hand, Silas Trudge was dead. What was I to do with the packet? I did not know the name of the man it had come from. And what was it that he had said? If I didn't keep my word and deliver it to Silas Trudge, he would know. And then I was to look out for myself. My life wouldn't be worth a brass farthing, it wouldn't. I mopped my forehead with my handkerchief. I began to feel very uncomfortable. How would he know? I asked myself. Perhaps if I opened the packet I should find out, and so save myself. Clearly it was best to open the packet. I broke the seal on one of the flaps. From the packet I drew forth a number of tightly folded pages, which on opening out I discovered to be all over strange signs and words that I could make neither head nor tail of. I looked at the pages this way and that way, sideways and upside down, but it was no good. I could make nothing of it at all. "'Here's a pretty kettle of fish, my lad,' I said to myself. "'All this here is written in a sort of secret code, I suppose.' Now what are you going to do? I turned the pages over from beginning to end again, but there was nothing doing, nothing but signs and writings that had no sense nor reason to me. Slowly, and while I was thinking, I broke the seal on the other flap and spread the white paper cover out wide. Inside one corner of the cover was a scrap of writing in blue pencil. And glory be, it wasn't written in code. It was evidently a postscript written at the last moment, and ran, A little boat, first of month, ten o'clock. There was a drawing of a curved line with a cross at the end. As they don't know you, show the parrot, and they will tell you news. For half an hour I sat with my elbows on the dressing-table, reading and re-reading and puzzling over this message. At the end of that time I banged my fist down on the table. "'Got it, my lad,' I said. Black Jack suited the action to the word and brought his fist down with a crash on the table beside Jenny. "'I'll tell you what I'd made it out to be, shipmate. The curved line was meant to be the cob. It took me a rare time to spot this, I'll admit. And so I read that Silas Trudge was to go to the end of the cob at ten o'clock, at night, I supposed, where he would find a small boat.' To the people in the boat he was to show his left hand with the parrot tattooed on it, and then they would tell him the news, whatever that might be. But now Silas Trudge was dead, and he could not keep the appointment on the cob. What was it all about? What was it for? And tomorrow was the first of the month. What a pity! Stay a moment, I thought. A sudden idea had struck me. Why shouldn't I go down on the cob tomorrow night and hear the news? As they don't know you, the message ran, and I could easily draw a blue parrot on the back of my left hand. I knew something about tattoo work, but I wouldn't tattoo it on properly, or else I shouldn't be able to wash it off again afterward. But I would make it look like a real tattoo, and at night time it would pass without suspicion. "'Supposing it were not night-time, but ten o'clock in the morning? "'Well, anyway, I wasn't going at that time "'to be seen by Bruff or the landlord "'from the windows of the Golden Peacock. "'And besides, with all this caution, "'it was sure to be at night. "'I would go at ten o'clock tomorrow night,' "'I made up my mind. "'The hint of mystery about the old thing appealed to me. "'No arm could come to me,' I thought. I should only be going to the end of the cob. I wasn't much of an actor, I knew, but I reckoned I could play my part well enough, so long as they had never seen the real Silas, 
to keep them unsuspicious until I'd got well away from Lyme Regis and was back in London again. After which I should soon be on my ship and far away from the whole business. It was rather a silly thing to do when you come to think it over, but there you are. I was feeling a bit flat and wanted a snip of excitement. Anyway, I carried out my plan. The next day I stayed at the inn and spent my time in getting the parrot fixed up all right on my left hand, taking care not to let the landlord or anyone about the place see it. The evening turned out a bit rough, a big gale springing up, and every now and then the rain would come spattering down. I set out from the inn on the Charmouth Road about nine o'clock, and was soon in Lyme Regis. I was much too early, so I made my way down to the shore and sheltered in a bathing hut arrangement there. It was so dark that there was no chance of my being seen by my friend Bruff if I did not go too near the golden peacock. I particularly wanted to avoid Bruff, of course. As ten o'clock drew near, I approached the cob, and, climbing up onto it, walked along to the end. It was hard work keeping a foothold on such a blustery night, but I fought my way along to the end and stood still, looking out into the darkness. Below me the sea whirled and hissed against the great stone walls of the cob. My eyes soon grew used to the strange darkness of the sea, and I gazed steadily out, but there was no sign of a boat. "'You're an ass, Jack, my lad,' I said to myself. How if it isn't the first of next month instead of this month? Or perhaps first of month is only another secret code and means something altogether different. And I looked back shoreward at the twinkling little lights in the houses and thought of the warm, comfortable rooms behind those cheery windows and called myself ten times an ass for staying out there in the wind and rain when I might be sitting in warmth and comfort by an inn fire. What was I doing this for? All for what? I turned and took a pace or two backward along the cob, toward those beckoning lights, then turned again and looked once more to see. A little way out and coming toward the cob, I saw a shadow, darker than the black of the water. Another second, and the light of a lantern gleamed from the side, and I saw it was a small boat. My heart went bumpity-bump which Black Jack illustrated with a series of resounding thumps on the table. Then, springing to his feet, he clambered up onto the table and, pretending it was the cob, stood at one end, gazing out over the hearthrug. Jenny sat looking up at him, her eyes wide with astonishment and interest, as he proceeded to act the next part of his tale, getting more and more excited and violent in his movements as time went on. The boat seemed to be having difficulties on account of the rough sea, but in a few minutes she got round the side of the cob where the water was a bit calmer, and I stood and watched while they got her up close to the wall and made her fast with a rope to an iron ring. Close by this ring some stone steps led from the water up on to the cob. I could now see that there were two figures in the boat. One of them, a tall man, picked up the lantern, while the other, a little stumpy man pulled the boat round near the steps. The tall man scrambled out onto them and climbed up onto the cob. They had evidently seen me waiting there. I suppose my black figure would stand out against the grey-black of the skyline. They may have hailed me, but I did not hear them. I could not hear anything but the wind and the sea. When the tall man reached my side, he raised the lantern so that it shone on my face. "'Who are you?' his voice came through the roar of the wind. For answer, I held out my left hand. He looked down at the parrot drawn on the back of it, then he nodded his head. "'What news?' I asked him, shouting to make myself heard. "'All's well so far,' was his reply. The ship passes at midnight, and we are prepared. We've got the chart and know the exact spot where we're to get close alongside, sir. He won't have far to swim. And then we make for the caves, and you'll have arranged the rest, sir. It was my turn to nod my head. I had to let him think I had arranged the rest, of course. 
but what a hole I was getting into. What on earth was he talking about? What were they all up to? Who was going to swim? And what arrangements was I supposed to have made? If only I had been able to read that secret code letter. While I was trying to make up my mind what to say next, the tall man spoke again. We may have a bit of a job getting out there, so hadn't we better start at once, sir? If you'll follow me. What was this? They were expecting me to go along in the boat with them? Not if I knew it. Why? When they found out that I had made no arrangements, they'd suspect me, perhaps. And then what chance would I stand against the two of them out in a little boat on a stormy sea? It would be Jack for the fishes without a doubt. What I should have done next I do not know, but as the man with the lantern turned toward the steps, a figure came dashing up and almost collided with him. This figure was followed by another, waving his arms excitedly. "'What have you told him? What have you told him?' cried the first figure, seizing the tall man's arm and shaking it, so that the lantern was almost dropped. "'He's not Silas Trudge. That man's not Silas Trudge!' The second figure, who was the little fat man, shouted, flinging himself upon me and gripping my arms. I shook him off and struck out with my fists, and the next minute we were in the thick of a fight. And what a fight it was, on the top of that lonely sea wall, all in the dark, save for a glimmer of lantern light, with the wind howling about our ears and the sea lashing away below. I fought hard, I fought desperately, furiously, but it was three to one, and at last between them they got me down and fastened my hands and feet with a bit of rope. Now, what's it all about? gasped the tall man. Give me the lantern, said the figure that had first come dashing up the steps. As he raised the lantern and shone it in my face, I looked at him blinking and gradually I saw his face in the darkness behind the lantern. It was Bruff, the man I had seen sitting by the fire at the Golden Peacock, Silas Trudge's friend. He seized me roughly by the shoulder and twisted me round so that he could look at my hands tied behind my back. He evidently saw the parrot. Ha, he said, I thought so. Now what's your little game? I suspected you ever since our talk last night. You don't suppose that I let you go away yesterday without having you watched? I know where you stayed last night, and this evening I followed you myself to the cob here, and while you were talking to him, he pointed to the tall man who seemed bewildered by the turn of events, I slipped down to the boat and made a few inquiries. Now, what's your game? Come on, you might as well own up. And this ain't Silas Trudge, you say, said the tall man. But he's got the blue parrot. A bit of soap and water will fetch that off, sneered Bruff. Well, by this time I was feeling fair sick of myself. What an ass I had been to get mixed up in all this business. I'd had enough of shuffling, so I determined to out with the truth, although as a story it might sound a bit difficult to believe. When I heard from you that Silas Trudge was dead, I finished up, I thought I'd best see what was in the packet so as to know what to do next. I couldn't give it back to the man in Dieppe, and I didn't like to destroy it. Bruff was biting the ends of his black moustache. I think he could see I was telling the truth this time. I see, he said. You're an ass, my friend. But so am I for telling you Trudge was dead and so causing all this muddle. But I had a reason. Then he held out his left hand, and by the light of the lantern I saw a parrot tattooed on the back of it. This was the hand and arm that had been bound up in a sling yesterday. You! I cried in astonishment. Then why in this world of wonders did you tell me that you were dead? I tell you I had a private reason, a reason for telling any stranger who might inquire for me at that moment that I was dead. It was more convenient. I never dreamt you had a message from Dieppe for me, as the man in the boat here tells me you must have had. They were expecting to meet me here tonight. And now we mustn't waste any more time. You'd better hand me over that packet now. 
but how can I be sure that you are Silas Trudge after your telling me yesterday? I began. I can give you proof enough, besides the parrot. I have papers here in my pocket, and besides. But what need to waste more time in talking? I won't ask you to give me the packet. You can't. I'll take it. Which he proceeded to do, hastily searching me. As soon as he had found the letter, he said, Come along then, boys. There's not a moment to lose. I'll read this in the boat by the light of the lantern, only we must start at once. I thought for a second that they were going to leave me where I was, and I wondered how I was to make good my escape, tied hand and foot as I was. But Silas Trudge had other plans for me. As for you, he said, looking down at me, we must see that you don't go talking about tonight's little affair until we are through with our work. Here, you boys, give a hand here and throw him into the boat. We'll take him with us. He may be useful. In vain did I protest. I would say nothing. I would not give them away, I promised. I did not know enough about their business to do them any harm, I urged. The fact was I didn't want to be mixed up in the rest of the night's doings at all. I didn't like the sound of them. <laughs> That's all right, laughed Trudge. But I'd rather have your company than your promises, my friend. You must come with us. And without more ado, they bundled me down the stone steps and into the rocking boat. Black Jack was on the floor again by this time, pacing up and down between the window and the hearth rug. So we set out to sea. What a journey it was in that crazy little boat on such a stormy night. I thought every second that the boat would turn over and we should all be in the water. As soon as we had got under way, they untied my hands and feet. If we do turn over, said Trudge cheerfully, you might as well have a sporting chance. But now that you're free, you must make yourself useful, sharp. Which I did. What else could I do? It was three to one, and I had a feeling that Trudge would as soon tip me overboard as have any arguing. For about an hour we tossed about in the boat, making slow headway. My three companions took no notice of me, except when they issued a sharp command for me to do something. The tall man, the little fat man, and I managed the boat, while Trudge kept the lantern by his side, reading the secret code letter. He appeared to be understanding it all right, though it must have been a difficult task reading it with the boat pitching and tossing about so. After a while we came, evidently, to the right spot for waiting, for we began to tack up and down. Backward and forward, backward and forward we went, Trudge never looking up from the letter, not even when a wave splashed over and filled up his boots. I judged that it must have been about midnight when the little fat man started signalling with his arms to trudge. The gale was so high by this time that it was impossible to hear each other's voices. Trudge put his papers away and shrouded the lantern. Then, struggling upright in the boat, he looked in the direction that the man was pointing. A big vessel was looming up out of the darkness and bearing toward us. We close-hauled our sails and continued to tack to and fro about the same spot. As the ship approached, the tall man managed to steer our little boat well out of the circle of light coming from the big vessel so that we should escape being seen. Then, as if he wanted us to be seen, Trudge stood up in the boat and flashed the lantern once, twice. Then he shrouded it again. I sat stiffly in my corner of the boat, my eyes fastened on the passing ship. But I did not see anything happen. And so the ship passed and left us in darkness. But Silas Trudge's eyes had seen what mine had missed. No sooner had the vessel passed than he signalled the two men to bring the boat round and head for a certain spot. Then he uncovered the lantern and let it gleam over the water in that direction. A few minutes battling through the sea, and the rays of the lantern picked out something white in the hollow of a wave. It was the head of a man, a man fighting desperately to reach us. It was a marvellously neat bit of work, the way we got up to that man and hauled him into the boat. 
almost looks as if they're practised hands at this sort of work, I thought to myself. But I hadn't time to think anything else, because it was all hands on deck and no mistake for the next ten minutes. What with a soaking wet man in the bottom of a soaking wet boat and a soaking wet sail to hoist, and yourself and everybody else soaking wet? Well, I may be a sailor and used to the sea, but I prefers it to keep outside the boat I'm in. Anyway, we got going, hoisted the sails, and sped before the gale shoreward. We got a good bit of buffeting, but at length we beached at a part of the coast that was unknown to me. It looked dark and deserted, great cliffs rising up from the shore. We got the boat up high and dry, and all of us scrambled up the shingly beach. Trudge led the way into a great cave at the foot of one of the cliffs. It was well sheltered, and once again we could hear ourselves speak. A pretty sight we must have looked, all of us dripping wet and our teeth chattering with cold. Silas Trudge set the lantern down on the ground, and as we stood round it, his eye lighted on me. He scowled. Now, if it hadn't been for your interference, my friend, he said, there would have been food and drink and dry clothes here, but thanks to you, I got that code letter too late to carry out the instructions it gave. He turned to the man we had rescued from the sea. He did look a sight, to be sure. Shivering and blue with cold, I saw that he had hardly any clothes on. He was a man of medium build, with thin, pointed features. I did not like his face. It was more like a ferret's than a man's face. His black hair lay in long, wet streaks down his forehead. As I looked at him, he put up his hand to his face as if to feel for a moustache and beard. But he was clean-shaven. Trudge began to explain rapidly to the man what had occurred, meanwhile taking off his big coat and wrapping it round the shivering creature. When the ferret-faced man realised the situation, he burst out into angry abuse of Trudge. "'What did you want to go and say you were dead for, you idiot?' he cried. "'Private reasons, I've told you,' said Trudge surlily, looking as if he wanted to take his coat back again. I wasn't expecting any message from Dieppe, not till three months' time. You're twelve weeks too early. The stranger muttered something about having to come away earlier than he had expected, as things were getting too hot for him. Well, how was I to know? asked Trudge in an aggrieved voice. At the present time, I'm expecting to hear news from, from China, news which I don't want to hear. And when I saw this sailor fellow, I thought he had come with this news, which would have meant that I should have had to do something very dangerous, something I didn't want to do. I had made up my mind when the message came from my friends in China to send word back that I was dead. It was the only way I could get out of it. And the landlord of the Peacock backed me up. He's a friend of mine. How was I to know that this fellow had come from Dieppe? It was only at the end that I began to suspect he had not come from my Chinese friends. So then I had him followed to find out what he was up to. Well, all I can say is you've muddled the whole thing in a disgusting manner, said Ferret Face. Of course, the upshot of it was that they had a few words, and during their quarrel they let out one or two things which they hadn't meant me to know, I'm sure. I gathered they were both members of some shady secret society, as also were the tall man and the fat man, and my ugly diet man too, I supposed. Ferret Face had got into trouble somehow, and the rest of his brother members had had to help him to escape. Everything had worked smoothly right down to this end bit, and now here we were, without food or fresh clothing, and here was me knowing their secret and very much in their way. Look here, said Trudge. It's no use us going on like this and wasting any more time here. We'd best get away as soon as possible. The only thing is, your clothes. Pity you couldn't have swum in them. You can't appear in the village yonder like that. You'd attract attention. His eyes wandered from ferret face to me when the resentful look on his face suddenly disappeared. I've got it, he cried. 
This sailor fellow's been a thundering nuisance to us. To make up for what he has done, he shall lend you his clothes. I protested at once. What was I to do if they took my clothes, I asked. And what was I to tell my captain about my missing suit when I rejoined my ship? But none of them seemed to take any notice of what I was saying. I'm about my captain, I said. Say you went bathing and left your clothes on the beach and they got stolen, grinned the fat man. Say you had a fire in your house and they got burnt, laughed the tall man. Tell him the truth, if you dare, sneered Ferret Face. Aye, if you dare, echoed Trudge. But don't waste any more of our time. Off with your clothes now, as quick as lightning, unless you want us to give you a little help. He advanced in a threatening manner. But I'd had just about enough of their bullying by this time. Suddenly I shot out my foot and kicked the lantern over, and we were plunged in darkness. Black Jack kicked violently out at the fire irons and sent them clattering down on the hearth. There was a moment's confusion, and I could hear them stumbling about and falling over each other, which he illustrated by throwing two or three chairs on top of one another. In that moment I had darted out of the cave and down the shore like a madman. They were after me like a pack of hounds. On, on I ran, till I came to the boat by the water's edge. The tide had risen higher and was touching her. I gathered all my strength and with a tremendous push got her afloat in the water. So excited was Black Jack becoming that the noise he was making was truly deafening. As he uttered the last words, he pushed the table violently across the room and it crashed into the sideboard. Some crockery on it toppled over and came smashing to the ground. Jenny jumped to her feet. Black Jack took no notice of anything, but, turning round, seized an umbrella near at hand and waved it aloft. I leapt into the boat. He leapt into the air, coming down with a thud so tremendous that Uncle Nickel in the kitchen below started up in concern. Aunt Abby, who had heard the crockery breaking, was already halfway up the stairs. Seizing a couple of oars, I got away from the shore. It was a hard battle. The tide still rising was trying to carry the boat into land again. I fought desperately. Meanwhile, Trudge, realising what had happened, waded out in the water trying to reach me. The tall man plunged in also. I pulled with all my might. Then I saw that Trudge was swimming. Nearer he came, and nearer. Then his hand shot up and he caught hold of the side of the boat. I lifted one oar and brought it down, crash, on the back of his hand, and with a cry of rage he let go. The umbrella was brought down on the back of a chair with such force that it snapped in two. But this was Black Jack's last bit of damage for at that moment the door flew open and Aunt Abby appeared, followed by Uncle Nickel and a cluster of excited servants. He turned and swam ashore, and that was the last I saw of Silas Trudge. I hoisted my sail and got away. Black Jack stopped and gazed at the crowd in the open doorway with amazement. What's the matter? he asked. That's what we've come to find out said Aunt Abby, throwing up her hands in dismay as she saw the wrecked state of the room. Then Black Jack seemed to come to himself and realise things. Oh, I say, shipmate, did I do all this? he said. I was only telling a little story, ma'am, he said apologetically to Aunt Abby. I'll pay up for all the breakages, and I'm very sorry, ma'am. Only telling a little story, gasped Aunt Abby. It was a lovely story, said Jenny, clasping her hands together. A very expensive story, I should call it, said Aunt Abby, looking despairingly round the room. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of The House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro. Chapter 10 Uncle Nodding Jenny, you may remember, 
had always pretended that the imaginary Uncle Nodding gave her toffee to eat when she went to see him. When she thought of Uncle Nodding, she was so used to putting her tongue in her cheek, pretending to be eating toffee, that she did it without thinking when she went into the room where the real Uncle Nodding was. A dear old man with mild blue eyes was Uncle Nodding, and he sat by the fire because of his rheumatics. Of course, to do the thing properly, the real Uncle Nodding ought to have brought out a real paper bag and offered her some real toffee. But he didn't do anything of the kind, so Jenny was obliged to go on pretending the toffee part. I've got some pictures here to show you, Missy dear, he said. He was the only person who ever called Jenny Missy, and it made her feel rather nice and grown uppish. They're round about my little shop. They was drawn by Albert Crust, my shop boy. A rare one way his pencil is Albert, or with anything else for the matter of that. You should see him weighing currants. I never knew anyone make fewer currants go to a pound than Albert. And yet the weights are all right. I don't know how he does it. It's a gift. Shut the door, Missy dear, because of the draught. My rheumatics is a bit troublesome today. You didn't know I had a little shop, eh? But of course I have. Uncle Nodding's Little Shop I keep a little grocer's shop along the village street. My doorstep's worn and hollowed with the tread of many feet. And in and out and in and out the people come and go. And all day long I'm serving them and running to and fro. I keep the choicest bacon, the best of tea and soap, and sugar and tobacco, and firewood cheese and rope. And in and out and in and out, the shop bells tinkle tink, grows thirty, forty times a day, or even more, I think. For all the village comes to me, and every one you'll meet, inside my little grocer's shop along the village street. Albert Crust This is Albert Crust, by himself. He serves behind the counter, takes the orders round, and does anything and everything he ought and ought not to do. He's a rare help, that quick and that willing, almost too willing, as you might say. But he never gives over weight. He is sixteen come next April, but so small, I could put him in my pocket in a manner of speaking. To see above the counter, he has to climb up and stand on top of an empty sugar box. And what for you, Sonny? Or, now then, my little dear, he will say, with his hands spread out on the counter, for all the world like my old grandfather used to do. But you should see the way he can throw a loaf of bread right up into the air and over the counter, right down, slap, into a customer's shopping bag. All the boys in our village would give their ears to be able to do it like that and many of them have got a thrashing for trying to do it with a loaf of bread at home. The strange noises Albert can make with his mouth, too. All the children envy him. Besides imitating corks being pulled out of bottles and paper tearing, bees buzzing and dogs yelping, he would make queer croaks and gurgles which used to make me laugh. I couldn't make heads nor tails of what he was driving at, as you might say and many a laugh we've had together. But one day I found out it was supposed to be me he was imitating. I soon put a stop to it. No sauce, Albert, I says. No sauce now. Right you are, governor, he says. And no sauce it was. And no sauce will Albert have from any boy or girl that comes into the shop neither. And if they try it on, it's woe betide them. For Albert has got a little way that gives them such a fright, a little trick wi his eyes, makes them bulge out sudden like when he is annoyed, and then there is no knowing what he will do, from whipping off his apron and smothering them with it, to rattling down a whole pile of empty biscuit tins on top of them. Still, he is a good boy when he isn't roused, and a useful, and I wouldn't be without him. 
He never gives over weight. Here is a picture of the little boy who annoys Albert and me very much because he always runs all his words together like this. A pound and a half of dripping and a jar of jam. Albert sent him away with a bar of soap, but I don't think that is what he asked for. This is the little girl who came into the shop the other day and said to Albert, Half a pound of butter, please, and tuppence change for mother. And have you got a paper bag to give my little brother? He says he wants to blow it out and make it go off pop. He always wants a bag to blow when we come out to shop. Sunday in the shop On Sundays, when my shop is shut, I sometimes step inside and stand and look about. Here's this little shop of mine, I think, belonging all to me. And I can't help feeling a bit. It seems queer to you, I expect, to think how anyone can feel for an old sloping counter, a pile of biscuit tins, a bacon cutter and a shelf full of marmalade jars. Everything is very quiet and still. There's not a sound to be heard in the shop, except perhaps the buzzing of a fly on the window pane. There's the old brown painted till, the drawers of spice and packets of tea, and the glass jar full of bull's eyes, and the noisy coffee grinder, quiet now and fast asleep. I look along the bottom of the counter where the paint is worn and scratched away by the kicking and tapping and fidgeting of feet. Through a chink in the shutters the sun is shining, and Albert, in a new bowler hat, puts his head round the parlour door to know if I'm going for a walk. But I am not going out. I'd rather stay inside my shop, and stand, and look about. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of the House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro. Chapter Eleven Miss Ruby's Story. Jenny was very excited the day Miss Ruby invited her to tea. She washed her face, brushed her hair carefully, put on a clean pinafore and her new shoes and then she got her white cotton gloves out of her dressing-table drawer and looked at them. Somehow she always connected her cotton gloves, the only white pair she possessed, with Miss Ruby. It seemed the proper thing to do to put them on when visiting Miss Ruby. And yet, it might look so odd to wear them, Jenny thought, when she wasn't putting on a hat. She hesitated, put them back in the drawer, then got them out again and hurriedly stuffed them away in her pocket. She would feel more comfortable if she had them with her when sitting in Miss Ruby's room, even if she didn't wear them. They belong to visiting Miss Ruby, she said to herself. So she went downstairs with the gloves in her pocket. She found Miss Ruby in a yellow silk dress, with gold earrings and a long gold chain round her neck. She looked very beautiful. Indeed, so fascinating did Jenny find her that she could scarcely take her eyes off her or eat any tea. You are eating nothing, said Miss Ruby sweetly. Have one of these pretty little iced cakes. And with her own snow-white fingers she put one on Jenny's plate. Miss Ruby chatted gaily during tea and laughed a lot, showing her lovely white teeth. But Jenny was so overcome with admiration that she was stricken dumb and could only smile shyly whenever Miss Ruby looked at her. At length, when tea was finished, Miss Ruby said, Come and sit on this comfy cushion at my feet. That's better. Now, tell me, what has happened to that little tongue of yours? Miss Ruby's eyes twinkled. I often hear you chattering away in the garden. Jenny blushed and, a little confused, touched the hem of Miss Ruby's frock. How lovely this is, said Jenny softly. Miss Ruby's eyes lit up. Do you like it? she said. I'm so glad. 
I love silk myself. It's so beautiful to touch, so beautiful to look at, so beautiful to hear. It always makes me feel silky inside when I wear a silk frock. This was a new idea to Jenny, and she pondered over it for a few moments, wondering whether her blue serge frock was making her feel all sergy inside. I wonder if Aunt Tabby feels like alpaca, she thought, then quickly recalled herself, for Miss Ruby was speaking again. I'll tell you a little tale I know about a silk dress, she was saying. A yellow silk dress, something like the one I've got on, only, as you will see, made in a very different way. Miss Ruby ran her dainty fingers down the folds of her own silk dress and began her story, while Jenny sat on the cushion at her feet gazing adoringly up at her, one hand touching the hem of Miss Ruby's silk frock and the other in her pocket, clasping the white cotton gloves. The Yellow Silk Dress In a little country town, about forty miles from London, there lived a dressmaker named Miss Bent. She was what people call a visiting dressmaker, that is, one who goes round to various people's houses doing a day's sewing here and a day's sewing there. She got plenty of work to do because she was a clever dressmaker. One morning a carriage drove up to her door. The little dressmaker peeped through her window curtains all in a flutter and she saw the lady of the manor get out and come up to her front door. She had never done work for the lady of the manor yet and was delighted that at last she was going to be asked to do so. The lady of the manor was shown into the small front parlour and Miss Bent nervously offered her a chair. The lady of the manor was very large and wore a huge fur coat and a hat which seemed to make her larger than ever. She seemed to fill up half the space in the little front parlour. Good morning, she said graciously. I want you to come and do a couple of days dressmaking at the manor house. Miss Bent murmured that she would be very pleased indeed. "'Can you come tomorrow?' said her ladyship. "'I'm extremely sorry, but I am engaged tomorrow, your ladyship,' Miss Bent said apologetically. Her ladyship looked a trifle annoyed. "'The day after, then,' she said. "'Yes, the day after. Miss Bent would be very pleased,' she assured her. "'Very well, then. But now listen.' her ladyship continued. It's my daughter and my niece who want dresses made for them. They want special frocks, made in a hurry. We have got the materials in, already. But when you come to make them up, now listen carefully. I want you to make one of them, my nieces, look as hideous as you can. Your ladyship, gasped Miss Bent faintly. As hideous as you can repeated the lady. Put good needlework into it if you like, but make it so that the neck part will make my niece's neck look thinner than ever. And if you put pleats or frills, put them just a tiny bit wrong, so that they will stick out in the wrong places and lie down flat where they ought not to. Do you understand? Show me how clever you can be. Show me that you can do anything you like with material by doing what I ask. My daughter's frock I want made well, but my niece I want to teach her a lesson. She is so vain. Miss Bent felt a little bewildered. Never in the whole of her quiet life had she been asked to do so odd a thing before. If you do your work thoroughly and satisfactorily, I will pay you ten times as much as you usually get for a day's work, her ladyship said. She paused a moment, and then added, My request may sound strange to you. I expect it does. But, as I said, I wish to teach my niece a wholesome lesson. And besides, I have other private reasons as well. I shall be obliged to you if you will do as I require. But, but what about my reputation as a dressmaker? said Miss Bent. People will see your niece's dress. 
and I shall lose orders, perhaps. Leave that to me, said her ladyship. Your reputation will not be harmed in any way. No one that matters will see my niece in the dress, I give you my word. And in future, I will make a point of always recommending you to my friends, if you do what I ask satisfactorily. Miss Bent hesitated but a moment longer. Then she promised to do what was required of her. How could she refuse the lady of the manor? Nevertheless, as the lady of the manor drove away, Miss Bent felt a sinking at the heart, and for the remainder of the day was beset by a restlessness that was strange to her. Have you ever noticed how quickly the day after tomorrow comes? Sometimes it seems to come even quicker than tomorrow itself. At any rate, that's how it was with Miss Bent's day after tomorrow. The time came for her to go up to the manor house before she realised that tomorrow had come and gone. People who love their work, as Miss Bent did, always find the days too short. I wish there were forty-eight hours in a day and night instead of twenty-four, Miss Bent had been heard to say. So, on the day after tomorrow, she put on her neat blue serge coat and skirt and small black hat, buttoned up her kid gloves, and started off for the manor house. She was rather troubled in her mind. Being so fond of her work, she always liked to do it in a thoroughly satisfactory manner. She liked to make a success of whatever she put her hand to. But today she realised that her work could not possibly be an entire success. If she made the dress properly as she would like to do, it would not be a success in the eyes of the lady of the manor. If she spoilt it and satisfied her ladyship, what would the niece say? Miss Bent sighed. It was very tiresome. She was shown into a light, airy room at the manor house, and there she found everything in readiness for her the material and cottons, a tape measure, a sewing machine, and a pair of large bright scissors. On the table, beside the sewing machine, were lying two pictures, cut out from some magazine, showing the styles in which the dresses were to be made. As soon as Miss Bent had taken off her outdoor clothes, the daughter of the house, Miss Philippa, and the niece, Miss Helen, came in to be measured. They were both well-mannered young schoolgirls, but whereas Philippa's face was ordinary, pleasing and fresh, but very ordinary, Helen was decidedly pretty and attractive. Miss Bent, fluttering round with a tape measure and her mouth full of pins, supposed that Helen's looks were the cause of her vanity and the reason for her aunt's strange request. And yet, so far as Miss Bent could see, Helen did not appear to be vain. She had a simple, kindly manner, and Miss Bent liked her. Philippa seemed rather distant and cold in her manner toward the little dressmaker. She struck Miss Bent as being rather proud. With an experienced eye, Miss Bent took stock of the girls as she measured them, noticing their weak points, which should be hidden, and their good points, which should be made the most of. Philippa's neck was short and inclined to be thick so Miss Bent knew that she must shape her dress so as to make Philippa's neck appear as slim as possible. She had pretty arms. The sleeves of the dress must be short. She noted one point after another, and then she turned her attention to Helen. Helen, although her face was pretty, had a neck that was thin and bony, and her elbows were sharp and ugly. The neck of her dress must be cut very wide each side so as to make her look even thinner, Miss Bent thought sadly. And her sleeves must be extra short to show off the ugliness of her arms. A bunchy flounce across the back of her neck would give her a round-shouldered appearance. And if the waistline of her dress was put very low, Helen would look long-bodied and awkward. All these things and more Miss Bent observed while her tape measure was busy. But when the girls had gone, she sat down by the sewing machine, her hands lying idle in her lap, and thought for a moment in silence. What a shame it seemed, what a shame, to make this young girl look as thin and awkward as possible, and waste a length of beautiful material in doing so, 
when such a lovely and becoming dress might have been made. Miss Bent pulled herself together. This would never do. She had her work to do, and she must do it. She had promised. But what was the real reason for it all, she wondered, as she spread Helen's material out on the table and picked up the scissors. The material was beautiful in texture and colour, being a deep orange silk. Philippa's material was also silk, but of a lovely blue shade. Now that she had met Helen, Miss Bent felt grave doubts as to Helen's vanity. Of the two, Philippa had seemed to think the most of her appearance. Helen had taken an interest in Philippa's frock as well as her own. But Philippa had only been interested in her own. Miss Bent worked away with a puzzled frown on her face. When the girls came in again after lunch for the first trying on, Miss Bent learned a little more about them. Our grandmother is going to pay us a visit tomorrow evening, Helen chatted away. She hasn't seen either of us for years and years, not since we were babies, has she, Phil? She's lived abroad for a long time, in Spain. That's what we want these new dresses for. It's a special occasion, her visit, isn't it, Phil? Philippa nodded. She did not approve of her cousins talking like that to a dressmaker, and meant to tell her so directly they were outside the sewing-room door. I'm longing to see her. I've heard such a lot about her and her funny ways said Helen, smiling. Do you remember the story, Phil, of how Granny once... Helen! broke in Philippa coldly. You're treading on a piece of my dress stuff, and look at that cotton cot all round your shoe button. Do be careful. And please don't talk so much. You worry me while I'm trying on my dress, and I can't think. Sorry, said Helen good-humouredly, then laughed as she untwisted the cotton. I have got this in a muddle, Miss Bent. I'm dreadfully sorry, she apologised. It's all right. Doesn't matter a bit, said Miss Bent hurriedly, wishing it was Philippa's dress she had to spoil. I begin to see light, thought Miss Bent to herself. It is before the grandmother that her ladyship wants Helen to look her worst. The grandmother with her funny ways, who hasn't seen these girls since they were babies. I wonder what it all means. And as she continued her work, the dressmaker was sorely tempted to make Helen's dress as she knew she could make it, in a way that would suit Helen and make her look charming. I ought never to have promised her ladyship, said Miss Bent to herself more than once. I don't like it at all. But she kept to her work and sewed steadily for the rest of that day and the best part of the following one. About tea-time on the second day the dresses were finished, and Miss Bent rang the bell for Lily, one of the maids, and requested her to ask the two young ladies if they would come and try on their frocks before she went home. The girls were full of excitement as they came hurrying into the room followed by the lady of the manor. The excitement made Helen look prettier than ever, Miss Bent thought. Philippa's dress was tried on first. It was beautifully made, and it suited her excellently. Philippa looked almost pretty in it. Oh, isn't it lovely, cried Helen. You do look sweet, Phil. And she danced round her cousin and then stood still, gazing at the frock in admiration. A glow of pleasure came into her ladyship's eyes. Good, very good indeed, she nodded approval. But Miss Bent did not feel the satisfaction she would have done at any other time. She dreaded the next five minutes. Helen slipped eagerly into her yellow silk frock, and Miss Bent fastened it up for her with fingers that trembled slightly. When all was ready, Helen stepped before a long mirror that hung on the wall and looked at herself. And as she looked, the eager light in her face slowly faded. She turned toward Miss Bent with a puzzled, almost hurt expression in her eyes. But Miss Bent avoided her glance and stooped quickly, pretending to take a pin out of the hem of the dress. Her ladyship surveyed Miss Bent's work with great approval. It was even better than she had hoped. Her niece looked scraggy and round-shouldered, long-bodied and out of proportion. 
with her thin legs and bony elbows greatly emphasised through the dressmaker's skill. At the sight of the failure she appeared in the dress made of beautiful yellow silk, Helen's prettiness seemed clouded for the time. It really was decidedly better than her ladyship had hoped. Excellent, she said aloud. You have made a splendid job of it, Miss Bent. It is delightful. I am more than satisfied. But, aunt, faltered poor Helen, it, it doesn't look right to me. What's the matter with it? I look so dreadfully thin. You are thin, my dear child, said her ladyship. There's no getting away from the fact. Yes, but not as thin as, as all that. What is the matter with it, Miss Bent? asked Helen. Miss Bent stood up, stroked down one of the pleats, and suddenly found she was looking straight into Helen's wistful eyes. Her own filled with tears at the disappointment in the child's face. Miss Bent fumbled for her handkerchief, tried to speak, but it was too late. She felt the tears creeping down her cheeks. Oh, Miss Bent, don't, please don't, she heard Helen's voice full of remorse. What a beast I am, when you've worked so hard on this frock to get it done in time. And you must be so tired. It's all right. It really is all right. Please don't, Miss Bent. You mustn't be disappointed at what I said. It was only, only just at first. Perhaps it will look different when my hair's done properly. Helen could never bear to see anyone in tears. Her own disappointment was forgotten for the moment in her pity for Miss Bent. She did not know that the dressmaker's tears were tears of anger and remorse, rather than of disappointment. "'There, there, Miss Bent,' said her ladyship. "'You are overtired. Run away up to your rooms, girls, and Philippa, tell James to order the carriage round. You must ride home, Miss Bent. Yes, I insist. The carriage can put you down at your door, and then go to the station to meet a guest we are expecting this evening.' Now let me settle my bill with you. I am extremely pleased with your work, and I shall recommend you to all my friends. Run away, Helen, and don't worry, Miss Bent. Yes, yes, child, she knows you're sorry. It's all right. So Miss Bent drove home in her ladyship's carriage with ten times as much money as she usually got for her work. But her heart was heavy, and her eyes were full of tears. This was the end of the incident as far as she was concerned, Miss Bent thought. She would never know the sequel to her ladyship's strange request. But the following day Miss Bent proved herself wrong by discovering, quite by accident, the end of the story. Miss Bent jumped into the train to go to the next village where she was to do a day's dressmaking, and found that the only other person in her carriage was Lily, her ladyship's maid. I'm leaving these parts, said Lily. Left the manor for good and all. Left the manor, said Miss Bent. But I thought you had been with her ladyship for years. So I had, Lily nodded. But I'm leaving. Got the sack, she announced, smiling. Sack, echoed Miss Bent. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm glad, said Lily. Taking all in all, and I'd do what I did last night all over again if I got the chance I would. We did have a scene, she said with relish. Miss Bent looked at her surprised and questioningly, and Lily, only too glad to have a listener, told her story. It seemed that the grandmother had come to dinner the night before, as arranged, but events had turned out very differently from her ladyship's expectations. The grandmother, according to Lily, was an old and ugly person who loved everything that was beautiful to look at around her. She had a queer temper and odd ideas. The special reason for her visit to England was to see all her grandchildren. The one she took the greatest fancy to was to be invited to go back with her to Spain and then to accompany her on a tour around the world. It would be a golden opportunity in more ways than one for the lucky grandchild chosen. 
for the grandmother had a large private fortune of her own, and, who knows, the grandchild she took with her might inherit this fortune. Miss Bent began to understand her ladyship's motive for wanting Helen to create an unfavourable impression, and why she desired Philippa to outshine Helen on this particular occasion. Ten minutes before the grandmother came, continued Lily, I met Miss Helen and Miss Philippa coming downstairs. And there was Miss Helen in that yellow frock. No offence to you, Miss Bent, but it did make her look a sight. I don't know how you did it. Couldn't you see what was wrong? But never mind that now. I wished she could have put on an old white dress of hers that I knew was upstairs in the wardrobe. Sweet in that she always looked. But her ladyship had insisted on both the young ladies wearing their new dresses in honour of their grandmother's visit. And of course Miss Helen didn't know why her grandmother was coming. Though some of us servants knew. And Miss Philippa too, I'm thinking. Well, I stopped at the top of the stairs, resting a tray I was carrying on the banisters for a moment while I looked down at Miss Helen, who had stopped halfway down to speak to her ladyship who was about to come up. All of a sudden the tray slipped from my hands, and over the banisters it went, crashing down below, while the things that had been on it flew about in all directions. I screamed, her ladyship screamed, Miss Philippa screamed, and then I saw what had happened. The ink out of a large pot that had been on the tray had gone all over Miss Helen's yellow silk frock. A great streak of it, from neck to hem, and all down one side of her face it was too. And this was not all. A jug of water I had been carrying had drenched one arm and side, and there were all bits of broken glass on the stairs. Of course there was a dreadful scene, though Miss Helen said it didn't matter a bit and afterward I'm sure I heard her laughing in the bathroom when she was washing all the ink off herself. She had the taps rushing noisily, but I heard her laughing, I'm sure I did. It was a mercy the glass didn't cut her, but she wasn't hurt a bit, only startled. Of course, the yellow dress was ruined, and her ladyship was furious and gave me notice on the spot. But Miss Helen came down to dinner in her old white frock, looking as sweet as a rose. She pushed a note under my door late that night, telling me how sorry she was I was leaving, and telling me she didn't mind a bit about the dress. She was glad, she said, she hadn't liked the dress. Miss Bent had been listening to all this in wondering silence. And the grandmother? she asked quickly. It was all the talk among the servants this morning that the old lady had quite made up her mind which of her grandchildren to take back with her. Of course it was Miss Helen, queried Miss Bent eagerly as the train stopped at her station. Of course it was Miss Helen, said Lily, smiling. Who could help it, with her kind heart and sweet face looking her best and all in her old white frock? Miss Bent, who was on the platform by now, turned and looked through the carriage door. Lily, she began, I'm so thankful you undid my unfortunate work. But I'm sorry you've lost your post through it. Surely her ladyship might have realised that it was purely an accident. And after having you all these years... Accident, repeated Lily, and she laughed. Goodbye, Miss Bent. And don't you worry about me. I'll soon get another job. Lily leaned out and waved her hand as the train began to move. Miss Bent stood perfectly still until the train was out of sight. She was still thinking of Lily's odd laugh. Accident, said Miss Bent to herself. No, she did it purposely. She dropped that tray purposely so that Miss Helen shouldn't be able to wear the ugly yellow silk dress. Of course she did. Why didn't I think of that before? End of chapter 11
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro. Chapter 12 Taramina's Tale. When Jenny went to tea with Taramina, she found that, although she was indeed foreign, she could speak English. Rather curious English, it is true, and often difficult to understand. But after a while, Jenny got used to it. If it were written down as Taramina said it, it would be very difficult to read. So the story she told to Jenny, and that Jenny repeated to me, and that I am writing down for you, I have put into English which all of us can understand. Jenny asked me to tell you this because she wants you to know that Taramina really is awfully foreign, and she was afraid you mightn't realise this when reading her story, unless you were told. The story came through Jenny's saying, as she was spreading some apricot jam on her bread and butter, What beautiful beads they are round your neck! Ah, said Taramina, but yes, they are beautiful, are they not? I would not part with them, I dare not part with them, for anything in the world. They hold for me a warning, which they will give me when the time comes. Jenny crinkled her eyebrows up. You not understand what I mean? No, of course not. But please to take some more bread and butter, and I will explain myself, said Taramina. The Necklace This story has no beginning and no end, only what you would call a middle. This necklace of beads that I am wearing, and which you call beautiful, you have never seen a necklace exactly like it, have you? No, it is very rare, it is very special, and I will tell you how I come to wear it, and why I would not give it away, not for all the gold you could offer me. For hundreds of years this necklace has been in the possession of our family. It is constantly being passed on from one to the other of us in turn, and to each wearer it does a kindness by warning when danger is ahead. How can beads give a warning? I expect you are saying to yourself. I will tell you. Whenever the person who is wearing these beads is about to run into some danger, the necklace breaks and all the beads are scattered. No matter how strongly the beads are threaded, no matter how firm the clasp, the necklace breaks apart. That is a sign. Whatever the owner of the necklace is about to do, she, or he, must stop, stop at once. It is a warning that there is danger in whatever she was about to do. Afterward, she gathers up the scattered beads, puts them back in their casket, and takes them to the head of our family, who threads the beads again, and passes the necklace on to the member whose turn it is to have them next. And there is one very curious thing. When they break and scatter, always one bead disappears, is lost. Search how you will, one bead is always missing. It has ever been so. This necklace was once a long chain, three hundred years ago perhaps. But it has broken many times, and grown smaller and smaller, until it is the size you see it now. And when it breaks on me... One of these beads will roll away, and I shall not be able to find it, and so I shall pass on the necklace with one bead less. So it will go on, until the last wearer has merely a necklace of thread, with one bead in the centre. When that breaks, it is the end, and no more will the necklace give its warnings to our family. All this sounds very strange to you, no doubt. You can hardly believe it. Well, I can only tell you that it is so. The beads came from a mummy's tomb, so I have been told. But how it was discovered that they had so strange a power to protect the wearer, I do not know. I tell you that there is no beginning to this story. But I can tell you the middle, which is about the person, alas, who had the necklace before me. Ah, but she was foolish, my cousin Tessa. She was too... What you call it? New, up to date, uh, too modern. These beads, she said, old superstition. When they break, the thread has worn out. 
and she would not heed our grandmother's solemn warning when it became her turn to have the beads. "'I will wear the beads because I think them beautiful,' said Tessa. "'But when they break I will take no notice. I will prove to you, and to all the rest of the family, that you have been wrong to keep up this old superstition.' Tessa had found out that all down the years no one had ever defied the warning when it came. So how can you know that anything dangerous would have happened? Perhaps if they had all gone on doing what they were doing when the beads broke, no harm would have come to them. And then it would have been absurd, and we should not have had this old story handed down. Tessa argued, and would not listen to advice. She insisted that when the warning came to her, she would disregard it and see what happened. For months she wore the necklace, went about her work with it always round her neck. And then one day she set out to go to the sea for a holiday. Her brother went with her to the station to see her off. They had scarcely arrived on the platform and were attending to a porter who was putting Tessa's luggage in the train, when suddenly the necklace snapped and the beads rolled over the platform. Tessa stood perfectly still for a moment. She went very white. Then, as she heard the gasp of dismay her brother gave, she tossed her head and smiled. "'We must gather them up quickly,' she said, "'or I shall lose the train.' And she began picking up the beads and putting them into her handbag. "'Tessa!' said her brother in a voice of reproach, don't be silly. I will tell the porter to get your luggage out again quick. You will do nothing of the kind, said Tessa, pretending to laugh. Whatever for? But her hands were trembling. Whatever for? echoed her brother. Why, of course you can't go. After this, we'll go straight home. Leave my luggage alone, said Tessa. I am going by this train. Of course I am going by this train. Aunt will be waiting at the other end for me. And besides, you know what I've always said. But her brother, very excited by this time, pleaded hard. There would surely be an accident to the train and she would be killed, he said, and implored her not to fly in the face of the warning. He begged and pleaded and threatened and scolded, but it was all in vain. Very white, but very determined, Tessa got into the train. "'I will send you a telegram directly I meet Aunt,' she said, smiling and trying to speak carelessly. And as the train began to move, she waved her hand from the carriage window. The train steamed out of the station, and Tessa's brother stood straining anxiously to catch a last glimpse of her, for he felt certain he would not see her again. I ought never to have let her go, he said to himself as he hurried home to await her telegram. But what could I do? She is not like a small child that I could pick up and carry into a cab. She must go her way. And secretly he felt rather proud at the courage she had shown. Two hours later her telegram came. She had got to her destination quite safely. There had been no accident to the train. Tessa's brother was overjoyed. After all, Tessa had been right, she with her sensible ways. Still, he would not be quite easy till she was home again. The warning might have meant that some ill luck would befall her on her visit, not on her journey there. But he would banish these mournful thoughts. He would not think any more about the warning, he determined. A week went by, and then one evening another telegram arrived. It was from the aunt. She was in terrible distress. Tessa had gone out in a little boat for a sail, and she had not come back. The boat had floated in upside down. Tessa was drowned. They found her later, poor foolish one. She had defied the warning, and she was dead. So the necklace was passed on to me, and I am waiting. When the warning comes to me, I shall take heed. I shall remember poor Tessa. And now you understand why my story has only a middle. No beginning and no end. End of chapter 12
Chapter 13 of The House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro. Chapter 13 Peter Bollin's Tale. Come in, come in, cried Peter Bollin, rising and beaming and waving his hand toward Jenny. Do come in. I was just thinking about you. Where are you? said Jenny shyly. Yes. I was thinking, I wonder when my little lady will come and see me again. I've got something I want her to do badly. No, I don't mean that. I don't want it done badly. But I badly want it done, Peter Bollin laughed. Look. And he held up for Jenny's inspection a brown leather glove. No buttons, he pointed out sorrowfully. They've both fallen off. Do you think you could possibly be so kind? Of course Jenny would sew the buttons on for him. She was only too glad to do it. She admired Peter Bollin very much. He was a handsome, tall man with brown eyes and a charming smile, and his hair was glossy and had a slight wave in it. Jenny thought it lovely hair. He was going a little bit bald on the top of his head. Only Jenny couldn't see this. I should love to sew the buttons on for you. Jenny said with her quiet, shy smile. Shall I go and fetch Aunt Abby's sewing box? If you would be so kind, said Peter Bollin. But what can I do for you in return? You must let me do something, please. Any special kind of sweets you like? Jenny shook her head, opened her mouth to speak, and then changed her mind and shut it again. What is it? asked Peter Bollin, smiling. If you would, I'd rather, I mean, I'd like it so if you would tell me a tale, with you in it, Jenny said a little breathlessly. Bless my heart, a tale? Well, so it shall be then, with pleasure. You run and fetch the sewing box while I think a minute, and as soon as you come back we'll start. Jenny hurried away to fetch the sewing box, and when she returned, Peter Bollin was sitting in his big armchair, leaning back, smoking. He sat up and smiled as soon as she appeared. How's this for a start? he said. In the house across the way, at ten o'clock each night, in the toppest window there will come a little light. I know exactly what it is. It's Peter Bollin's candle carried in a little jug that hasn't got a handle. Oh, said Jenny, but what does it mean? That's what I'm going to tell you, said Peter Bollin. Have you got the needle and thread? Good. And the buttons? Splendid. Peter Bollin's Candle I am a doctor. In my young days it was my ambition to work among the poor, especially poor children. The rich, I used to say to myself scornfully, half their illnesses come through overfeeding and the other half through not having enough work to do. I was very young in those days and very hot-headed. And when I went into the slums of London and saw the poor, half-starved, stunted little bits of humanity all about, my heart would ache with the pity of it all, the injustice of it all and I would pace up and down my room at night trying to forget what I had seen during the day, and yet not wanting to forget it. My parents were rather disappointed in me. They wanted me to become a fashionable doctor, one who had wealthy patients. For that was the only way to get on and make money, they said. But when they realised that my ambition was set in another direction, they said no more and let me go my way but I fear I was a sad disappointment to them. Well, about that time I went and lived down in a poor quarter of London, among the people I wanted to serve. I rented two very clean little rooms in a house near one of the hospitals I attended. All day I was busy out and about, and the long evenings I spent with my books, studying. I had to be very careful with money in those days, not having over much, and finding that my gas bill, when presented to me by my landlady, was always of alarming proportions, I took to using candles of an evening when I was reading. I used to sit at a big table with my books about me, 
my feet on a hassock, and a pipe in my mouth, and at my elbow a candle burning, which, as I told you, always stood in a little jug that hadn't got a handle. I liked it better than a proper candlestick. The jug had a wide top to it which served me for an ashtray. One night I was sitting reading, as usual. A church clock nearby had just finished striking eleven when I heard footsteps coming up the stairs toward the door of my room. I listened. I knew there was no one on the top floor at the present time, so that anyone climbing as high up as this must be coming to see me. I had few visitors in those days and certainly did not expect anyone that night. Outside my door the footsteps stopped and then came a timid knock. I got up and opened it at once. A woman stood on the threshold. She was pale and large-eyed and seemed to be in some distress. As I held the door open, the light from the flickering candle fell full upon her. I could see that she was poorly dressed, but neat and trim. Her thick black hair was sprinkled with grey, and her hands, which were fingering restlessly the corner of her white apron, were roughened with work. There was a lingering charm about her thin, worn face. She had been a very pretty girl when she was young, undoubtedly. What is it? I asked gently, for I could see she was trembling and nervous. Is there anything I can do for you? Oh, sir, she gasped, and the suspicion of a sob shook her voice. You, you are a doctor. Will you, will you do a great kindness? Come and see a child who is desperately in need of you. He is so ill, sir. Oh, sir, will you come quickly? Of course I will, I said, unhooking my coat from the back of the door. Is it far from here? The woman twisted the corner of her apron round and round in her hands. Then she stepped inside the room and closed the door softly behind her. It's, it's a funny thing I'm going to ask you she said in a strained, queer voice. I looked at her in surprise and stood still with one arm in my coat. All the folk round here talk about you, she said. I know what you're like. You're good to the poor like us, I, I've heard. That's why I'm going to ask you to do a strange thing. You've promised to come to my boy, who is very ill, perhaps dying. I nodded. Well, we must have a doctor for him, but I daren't let the doctor know what house he is being taken into. There is a special reason. She looked straight into my eyes. Her lips were trembling. We stood looking at each other in silence for a few seconds. The reason, she began, then stopped again. Oh, sir, I can trust you, can't I? She said imploringly. I can trust you. You can rely on me, I said. Tell me. She began to speak very hurriedly. It's my little son I want you to come and see, but, but he isn't hiding from the police. He has run away from a reformatory school. The magistrate sent him there for two years, but he wanted me, and he ran away. And now he is ill, so ill. I was frightened to go for a doctor. I don't want anyone to know the boy is with me. And then I thought of you. She was crying again by this time. Poor soul, I thought, these mothers, how they suffer through their children. I wondered what the boy had done to be sent to a reformatory school and how it was his mother had let him get into trouble. But there was no time for questions of that sort at the moment. I will come with you at once, I said. You can trust me absolutely. I give you my word. I had to explain about it now, she sobbed because when we get near my house I am going to ask you to close your eyes and give me your word of honour not to open them until I have led you inside. I have a special reason for asking you to do this. It's not that I don't trust you. I do, absolutely. But I'm certain it will be easier and better, better for you and better for us, if you do not recognise the house we live in. If the police come round making inquiries... I hesitated for a moment, telling her there was no need to take this precaution. 
but she seemed so upset at my hesitation that to humour her i gave way and said i would do as she pleased she told me then a little about the boy's illness and i gathered together a few things in my bag then we descended the stairs to the narrow draughty hall and there i blew out my candle which i had brought with me and left it on the hall stand for my return it was a raw foggy night and i noticed the woman shiver and pull her shawl closer round her as we stepped into the street she turned immediately to the right outside the gate and led the way to the end of the road and then turned off into a network of side streets we zigzagged in and out of these for a while and then as we came outside a small corner shop a baker's i think it was she slackened her pace for an instant and said now shut your eyes i did so i felt her catch hold of my arm and then we walked on it seemed to me that we walked a fairly long way after my eyes were closed down streets and round several corners presently however we came to a sudden standstill and i heard a door open i felt myself being gently pushed forward into the house and then after a pause came please open your eyes now i opened them and found myself in a dim narrow hall very like the hall in the house where i lived only the wallpaper was different glazed shiny brown stuff very shabby and partly peeled off i did not notice anything more about my surroundings for the moment as i was anxious to see my patient i found him in an upstairs front room tossing on a little bed in the corner the room seemed clean and tidy but bare and comfortless a low fire smouldered in the grate the boy a dark-haired little fellow of about twelve was certainly very ill and in a high fever i soon got to work and did what i could for him i will stay a while i said but meantime is there anybody you could send to get a few things that he will need i will go myself she said if you are staying here a bit but that's all right i sensed her hesitation at once please let me pay for the things now we can settle up afterward he must have these things i scribbled down a list of things on the back of an envelope knock up a chemist he'll let you have these it's urgent tell him while she was gone i sat quietly watching the face of the boy who was in a drowsy half-asleep state now what had he done i wondered to be sent to a reformatory he had not got the face of a bad boy where was his father i looked round the room and at the carefully drawn window blinds if i were to look out of that window possibly i should recognize at once where i was in which house i was for i knew the neighborhood fairly well but not for the world would i have looked through the window the boy's mother trusted me it was wonderful how she did trust me seeing how important to her her secret was what could i do for this little chap i wondered how had he got into the hands of the police even if his mother managed to hide him for a time he would surely be found by the authorities sooner or later and he would be taken back to the reformatory to finish his term there but the first thing was to get him better then i would see what could be done presently someone knocked with the knuckles on the room door and before i could rise the door was opened softly and an old woman peeped in how is he oh i thought mrs gray was here are you the doctor she said i nodded poor dear he does look bad she said looking down at the sleeping boy he is bad i said quietly but i hope we shall be able to see a change for the better before long how long has he been here i inquired do you mean how long has he been ill or how long has he been living here because he hasn't been either long a day or two he's been ill and him and his mother only came last week and took this room said the old woman smoothing the blue apron she was wearing i see i said you are the owner of this house i suppose she said she was and would have gone on to give me more information had not mrs gray returned at that moment laden with things she glanced quickly from me to her landlady she seemed flurried and rather upset 
the old woman lingered while i attended to the boy but presently she went away telling mrs gray in a kindly voice to all her out if she wanted her help in any way as soon as she was gone mrs gray turned to me doctor she said a policeman followed me i'm sure he did he watched me knocking at the chemist's side door and followed me all the way home do you think he recognised me is he after the boy she was all a tremble again come come calm yourself you mustn't give way like this i said and did my best to reassure her they won't take the boy from you while he's ill i forbid him to be moved doctor's orders besides i don't suppose that policeman recognised you at all on a foggy night like this too i stayed another hour and then as the boy was sleeping comfortably now i said i must go but would come again the next evening unless she sent for me before that i don't know how to thank you mrs gray said don't i replied wait until he is better you do think he'll get better with care i do i assured her i left the house in the same manner as i arrived with closed eyes mrs gray led me along several streets and round corners and when she told me to open my eyes i was at the same place outside the little baker's shop where i had first closed them mrs gray did not send for me the next day but soon after ten o'clock at night she came and escorted me to the house in the same manner as on the previous evening on the way i suggested again that it was scarcely necessary for me to shut my eyes that even if i did know the house and the police came i would not give her away but she seemed so upset at the idea, and begged me so earnestly to close my eyes, that once again I gave way, and after this I did not refer to the matter any more, but always closed my eyes and allowed her to lead me to the house. I found the boy a little better on my second visit, and better still on the third evening. For a week I continued to visit him each evening, but the following week it was only necessary for me to look in twice and after that he was up and about again on the last visit i paid him when he was practically well again i got him to talk about himself and how it was that he had been sent to the reformatory school it was a sad enough story the parts he could not supply being filled in by his mother the father was dead it seemed and the mother out at work all day and the boy had run wild he had met bad companions who influenced him so that he got beyond his mother's control one day he and another boy committed a number of small thefts as they were not found out they ventured on something bigger and broke into a house where an old lady lived all alone they were caught brought up at the police court and the result was the reformatory school he was not a bad boy really said his mother not till those other boys got hold of him why did you run away from the school i asked the boy whose name i had learnt was joe i hated it he said and when i felt ill i wanted mother and he told me the whole story of how he had managed to escape no easy task to escape from the school i gathered how it was they had not traced him so far was a thing that made joe marvel greatly well how much longer had you to be in the school i inquired another three months his mother said he's been there a year and nine months and what do you propose to do now that you are well again you can't go on hiding in this room for the rest of your life you know i said the mother shook her head hopelessly we don't know what to do she said if only we could get away i have a sister who keeps a farm right down in wales i believe she'd take us for a time while i did work on the farm only it's dreadful dreadful to have to go about guiltily always hiding afraid of knocks at the door you mustn't do that i said shall i tell you what i should do if i were you i turned to the boy he nodded watching me anxiously the look in his eyes made my heart ache so I turned my gaze away, fixing it on a scrap of torn wallpaper over the fireplace. If I were you, 
I should go back to the school, I said, give myself up and finish out the three months. I know it sounds hard, old chap, but isn't it better to stick it for the three months and then be free and go down with your mother to Wales and start afresh, instead of going about for weeks in fear and trembling? For it would only be a matter of weeks. They'd be sure to get you sooner or later, and then it would be all the harder for you. Oh, don't, his mother began to cry quietly. Don't send him back. It's not I that will send him back, I said. Joe will go back of his own accord and bear it like a man, for his mother's sake, so that she won't have to go about afraid of knocks at the door. If he goes back, it will be better for both of you in the long run. Can't you see that it will? I urged. I hated giving them this advice, but I felt sure it was the best course. Yet I dared not look at the boy's face while I was speaking, or I could not have gone on. How I wished I could have taken him away and given him a fresh start. He was a good little chap at heart, I felt sure, but he was weak-willed and easily influenced. Given a proper chance, he would turn out a decent man. You think it over, Joe, I said. Talk the matter over between you. And if you decide to go back, Joe, I'll go with you and explain that it was owing to illness that you ran away home and that I have been attending you and that now you are well again you have come back to finish your term. Perhaps this will save you from any punishment. I'll do my best anyway. If you decide to do this, come and fetch me. It is entirely in your hands, for I still do not know where this house you live in is situated. And now, Mrs Gray, if you will lead me out as usual, I finished, I shall be obliged. Good night, Joe, and good luck to you. And Joe, for your mother's sake, be a man. I took one glance at Joe's white, scared face and hurriedly took my departure. When I got back to my lodgings, I found a policeman waiting for me on the landing outside my door. If I might just have a word with you, sir, he said. Certainly, I replied, come in and I placed my lighted candle on the table. "'Well,' he said, "'I know you're interested in the children hereabouts, and know a rare lot of them, and I've been wondering if you could help me find a boy I'm looking for. It would be doing the other children a good turn to help me find him. He's a bad influence. Run away from a reformatory school he has. A thorough bad lot. Regular nuisance to his poor mother.' and a real danger to the other children. We believe he's somewhere in this neighbourhood, hiding, and we was wondering if you had happened to come across him. I looked at the policeman. How much did he know, I wondered. Had he been following me at any time? What's the boy's name? I asked abruptly. Joe Brunswick, his name was, answered the policeman and then brought a notebook out of his pocket and consulted it, as if to make sure of this fact. I had wondered if Grey was Joe's real surname. Brunswick, I repeated, then shook my head. No, I haven't come across anyone with that name. You might know the boy by sight, then, said the policeman. And the policeman began describing Joe in such a way that I should never have recognised him. Crafty little face the policeman said, regular bad lot. I don't recall any boy answering to that description, I said. Oh, said the policeman, we was in hopes that you would help us. If you should come across him, you'd be doing a service, sir, if you'd kindly inform. I'll keep a lookout, I said. I know most of the children round here, and I've got a good memory for faces. I never forget a face once I have seen it. This was a stupid thing to have said. I realised it was a mistake directly the words had left my mouth. Ah, I'm glad of that, said the policeman, feeling in his pocket. I've just remembered. I brought a photo with me of this boy I was describing to you. Here it is. Have you ever seen that face before? And the policeman put in my hand a photograph of Joe. I looked at the weak, nervous face in the photograph and considered. 
"'But this is not a bit like the boy you described, Constable,' I said, "'to gain time while I made up my mind what to say next. "'This is not a crafty face. It's only weak.' "'It's what I calls crafty,' said the policeman. "'Well, anyway, the face seems familiar to me,' I admitted. "'I said I never forget a face, and I don't. "'I have seen this boy somewhere. But where?' At any rate, if I see this boy again, I shall know it's Joe... What did you say the name was? Brunswick? That's right, sir, said the policeman. I suppose you don't happen to have seen the face recently, could you remember? He added. I looked at him sharply. Something in the tone of his voice alarmed me. You don't happen to have been in a house quite recently, where you saw a boy something like this? Asked the policeman. I have told you, Constable, I began, but the policeman raised his hand and beckoned me toward the window. Would you mind blowing out your candle for a minute, sir? he said. I looked at him wonderingly, then did what he asked, keeping the candle in my hand ready to light again. The policeman drew back the curtains before my window and pointed through the pane to the window of a house directly opposite, on the other side of the road. The window he pointed to was heavily curtained, but a chink of light at the top suggested that the room was inhabited. "'You don't happen to have been in that house, that room, tonight,' he said. "'Come, sir, I'm afraid it's no use your denying it. And though I appreciate your kindness of heart in trying to shield the boy, it's no use, sir.' "'What do you mean?' I demanded. "'To the best of my knowledge, I have certainly not been in that house tonight.' or any other night. There was silence for a few moments while the policeman drew my curtains to again, and I relit the candle. "'Well, I'm sorry, sir,' said the policeman solemnly. "'It must have been my mistake. I distinctly saw you, or rather thought I saw you, coming out of that house with a lady, and you walked away, all round the streets, and round and round, and into your gate here.' I am very surprised to hear that I have been in that house opposite, I said. I did not know that I had. Which was perfectly true, but I could see that the policeman did not believe me. I am sorry, sir, he said again. I thought you'd have helped me. I am really telling you the truth, I protested. He looked at me but said no more, except to wish me good night. Good night, constable. I said, and as I heard his heavy boots descending the stairs my heart sank, for I knew that in spite of my efforts a warrant would be out tomorrow to enable the police to search the house opposite to mine for the purpose of finding Joe Brunswick. I sat down by my table and thought for a while. I had never dreamed it would be the house opposite. I had thought it many streets away. What could I do now to help Joe and his mother? If only the boy had gone back to the reformatory before the police had found him. But they hadn't found him, yet. I dare not go across and warn Joe. My policeman, or another one, would probably be watching the house. I was glad it was so late at night. A few hours must elapse before the warrant could be out. At that moment came another knock at my door. I got up and opened it, wondering if it was the policeman come back. "'Joe!' I exclaimed as the boy stepped into the room. "'You! At this time of night! And this night of all nights!' "'I had to come at once, sir,' said Joe. "'To tell you, I've made up my mind to go back, sir, if you'll take me. "'I thought I'd better come and tell you now while I... while I felt I could. "'And then, when I'd promised you, I knew I'd go.' "'And the reason, Joe?' I asked wondering if he had any suspicion about the policeman. But his next words and the look he gave me banished that thought. A tinge of colour crept into the boy's pale cheeks. It was what you said, sir. His voice faltered. I understood and held out my hand. Shake hands, Joe, I said. And then I told him about the policeman. But we'll get ahead of him, I said, and go by the first possible train before they come to search your house. 
fancy you're living right opposite me all the time, and I never knew. Joe nodded. He used to watch for the light in my window every evening, he said. His mother used to pull the curtains apart, a tiny slit at one side so that he could see Peter Bolin's candle from his bed. When you come back again, Joe, in three months' time, I said, I'll take you straight down into Wales to join your mother. I'll see she goes off there as soon as possible. Do you know how to ride a bicycle? No. Oh, well, you'd soon learn. I know of one you might like to have. It would be useful in the country. You shall have it directly you come out. Now that he was going back, I felt I must give him something to look forward to. Joe's eyes gleamed. We made our plans quickly. It was past midnight now, and I thought it wiser that Joe should stay with me for the night, and we should start out very early in the morning. But how were we to let Joe's mother know? It was against her wishes that he had run across the road in the dark, but he had told her he felt he must come. I must go across, I said, and just risk the policeman seeing me. It's a very dark night, luckily. She'll be down by the front door waiting, I expect, said Joe. Which she was. All the rest of the house was in darkness, and she was waiting quietly just inside the front door. I explained things to her rapidly, and now Joe had decided to go back to the reformatory, she was as anxious for him to go before the police got him as I was. She quickly fetched his hat and coat and one or two things from her room and handed them to me. She agreed that it was better for her not to try to see him before he went, in case in the early hours of the morning she should be seen by the policeman. I will take every care of Joe, I assured her, and hastened back to my rooms. In the early hours of the morning, just before dawn, Joe and I set out and travelled safely back to the reformatory school. I explained matters to the head and fortunately was able to get Joe off from punishment. I promised to be responsible for him when he came out and my last memory of him as he was led away was of a pale, scared little boy trying to smile as he bid me goodbye. I went home and walked up and down my room all the evening. The following day I made arrangements for Mrs Gray, or Mrs Brunswick as she really was, to go down into Wales. I'll bring Joe down myself as soon as he's out, I promised her. You go and be getting a place ready for him. I don't know however I'm to pay you, she said. I don't want to be paid. I've taken a liking to Joe, I told her frankly. Three months passed quickly with me, busy with my work, but Joe said afterward they seemed three years to him. When the day of Joe's release arrived, I, almost as excited as he was, went and fetched him away. We came back to London, and he had a fine dinner at a restaurant, and then I took him down to his mother in Wales. Remember, Joe, I said to him in the train, I've promised to be responsible for you now, so don't get me into trouble. You won't fail me, will you? Joe promised, very quietly, but very earnestly, and he kept his word. All this happened some years ago when I was a young man, but I've never lost sight of Joe. He's grown into a proper man, a fine fellow, and he's got a farm of his own now, in Wales, and his old mother does the housekeeping for him. Do you know what started me thinking of him again today? This old ash tree I keep up on the mantelpiece. When I started to smoke, I reached for it, and you see what it is? I keep it, why do I keep it? Out of affection, I suppose. It used to be my old candlestick, this little jug that hasn't got a handle. End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of The House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro. Chapter 14 The Rhymes of Mr. Dennis. 
Mr. Dennis was a big, broad-shouldered man, with a kind, tired face, shaggy hair, and loose-fitting clothes. He had been very ill, Aunt Abby said, and had come for a rest and to get his strength back. "'I haven't told you yet about my little girl Pat, have I?' he said one day when Jenny came in with a ball of string that she had bought for him. His fingers were busily at work on a kite that he was making. "'This is for her,' he explained. "'She loves kites because she can rush about with them and not look where she's going. "'She's just about as old as you, Jenny, perhaps a wee bit taller. "'But the tomboy she is, you'd never believe.' "'Jenny leant against the table and watched his fingers gravely. "'Tell me about your little girl,' said Jenny. You couldn't find anyone so good and so naughty all at one and the same time, nor yet so lovable, not if you search the world over, said Mr. Dennis, the corners of his mouth twitching. She has a way with her. Tell me, said Jenny, please. I know what. I'll tell you some little rhymes that I made up about her. Things she's done and things she's said to me, if you like said Mr. Dennis. This is how they go. Pat. Torn brown jacket, crushed straw hat, hole in stocking. That's our Pat. Where's she been to? What a sight. Only playing. Tomboy, quite. Very naughty. Scold her, do. Pat looks up and smiles at you. Something magic in Pat's smile. Scolding doesn't seem worth while. Such a happy little face. Makes the world a jolly place. Never mind her clothes and hat. Only playing. She's our Pat. Pat washes her face. It's Patsy go and wash your face. Or go and wash your hands. And all day long I'm being told, but no one understands. When they're grown up, they must forget how hard it is to be so really awful clean all day when you're a girl like me. I wonder why I wasn't made to keep on growing clean, instead of growing dirtier. It seems a waste, I mean, to think of all the water that has washed my face and hands, and all the miles and miles of soap, but no one understands. And even if things did get changed about the other way, Good gracious me, how clean you are! Get dirty quick, they'd say. Calling for Jill When all us children call for Jill to come to school each day, her granny through the window always calls to us to say, Now don't tread on my pansy beds, you there with yellow socks. Or, careful there, you, Patsy. And then on the pane she knocks. And all of us are careful as we don't know what she'll do, cause someone told us she's a witch, and just in case it's true, we rattle on the letter box and run out quick and wait, and don't do what we oughtn't till we get outside the gate. End of chapter fourteen. Chapter fifteen of The House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro. Chapter 15. The February Lady's Story. Jenny did not know why she called her the February Lady. It may have been because it was the first day of February when she first thought about her. Jenny had always imagined the February Lady dressed in cloudy grey, and when she found her, so she was. The February lady was fond of animals. Jenny knew this because Aunt Abby's little kitten was always to be found in the room where the February lady lived. It's such a dear, she said when Jenny came to fetch it one day to give it its dinner. But what a mite it is! I expect it looks extra tiny to me because at home I have got two enormous cats. Like small dogs they are. They will be glad to see me when I get back. What are their names? asked Jenny. Chubby and Smooge, 
said the lady. What funny names, Jenny smiled. Why did you call them Chubby and Smooge? I don't know. The names just came. I knew directly he stepped out of the basket that he was the Smooge, and Chubby there could be no mistake about. How did you find them? inquired Jenny. Well, the lady began, but wait a minute. First you go and fetch the kitten's dinner. Haddock, said Jenny. It'll love that, the lady nodded. Bring the haddock up here, and while the kitten's having it, I'll tell you about Chubby and Smooge. Jenny was soon back with the plate of fish, and while the kitten purred and ate, both at the same time, the February lady smoothed out her cloudy grey frock and sat down on the hearthrug beside Jenny and the kitten and told her story. Chubby and Smooge If you pass through a certain quiet court in the middle of London, you will find, almost any day of the week, the biggest and fattest cat you have ever seen sitting on the steps before one of the doorways. This is Chubby. And up on a window sill above him, looking down into the court, you will probably see another huge cat with very long white whiskers. This is the Smooge. They are both tabby cats, though Smooge has four white paws, a nose that is half white and half tabby, and a lot of black on his back and tail. Chubby is tabby all over, with a thin black ring round his neck, like a necklet. But the really surprising things about Chubby are his cheeks. They stick out on either side of his face and make it look so fat. Just look at that cat's face, people say as they pass. Or, what a face! And Chubby meows and makes a funny little sound like thr -thr 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 at them because he likes attention and if they stop and stroke him, he rubs his head against them and meows again. The Smooge looks on at all this with interest. He is not very fond of coming down into the court himself, but prefers to look down on the passers-by from his window sill. He is very fond of Chubby, and sometimes when Chubby is out, Smooge will walk in and out of the rooms of the flat where he lives, crying and looking for his friend. Chubby is not so particular about Smooge. He likes him very much, but Chubby has a great many friends, and enemies, out in the court to take up his interest, while Smooge has only Chubby. He doesn't like a lot of friends. We found Chubby when he was a kitten, long before the Smooge came. Such a funny little broad-shaped plump-faced kitten he was. At that time we lived in a house by the sea, and one morning we saw him sitting on top of the garden wall. He sat there for a long time, such an odd little bunch, and meowed whenever we went out and spoke to him. Presently we took him a saucer of milk. Chubby liked this and began to purr loudly, and when he had drunk it up, sat down and waited for some more. So we gave him some more and after that he still sat on the wall and waited. Whoever can he belong to, we said, and made inquiries all round the neighbourhood. But nobody seemed to own him, this funny little fat kitten. Perhaps he will go home if we take no notice of him for a while, we said. So we took no notice, but he didn't go home, and didn't move off the wall, until dinner time when we found him on the step outside the back door. He crept in and sat by the kitchen fire, and we gave him some dinner. He slept by the kitchen fire that night. And the next day we could see that he had quite made up his mind to adopt us. So we were adopted, and we called him Chubby, which is his real and only name, although he's always having fresh nicknames invented for him. Names that last for a day and are then forgotten. Out of this crowd of names, there is one that is not entirely forgotten. It comes back at long intervals, when Chubby is looking like it. This name is Hoobleboobles. I can't explain to you what a Hoobleboobles looks like, 
but if you were to see Chubby you would understand at once. There are times when he is exactly like one. He was a mischievous little kitten, and one of his favourite tricks was to hang on to the end of the broom when the floor was being swept, and he would hang on so tightly, thrashing the brush with his hind legs, that it became impossible to sweep the floor unless we used Chubby himself as the brush. And then we came to live in London, in a flat. We wondered at first how Chubby would like it, after having a garden of his own to play in. He could go out as much as he liked, we thought, and there were grass and trees close by the flat. Chubby was a most obliging little soul. He quickly settled down amid his new surroundings, and soon knew every nook and corner of the neighbourhood of his new home. And whenever he wanted to come in, he would run up the short flight of stairs to his front door and push the door with his paw so that it rattled. And as soon as the rattle was heard, the door was opened at once. By this time, Chubby had grown from a little fat kitten into a big fat cat. He was always busy, filling up his days with eating, sleeping, playing and fighting. He loved a good fight, I'm sorry to say and there was one particular friend of his with whom he was always quarrelling. And after these quarrels, Chubby would come in with a scratch across his nose or a little piece bitten out of his ear, but always very cheerful and purry, with an air of, I may be a bit knocked about, but you should see what I gave him. He was always about the place somewhere, sitting on the window sill, or down on the step talking to all the passers-by, or continuing his quarrel with his friend in the court. One evening he asked to go out of the front door, and I let him out as usual. He ran with his fat little legs down the stairs and out into the court. I remember I looked down and saw the tip of his tail disappear round a bend in the staircase. I little dreamed at the time how long it would be before I saw the tip of his tail, or indeed any little bit of chubby, again. Chubby did not come in for his supper that night, nor was he in for breakfast the following morning, and the whole of the following day passed, and still no Chubby. This was unusual, but it was not until the next day came and went, and the next, and the next, and the next, and still no sign of Chubby, that we began to be really alarmed. A week went by. I made inquiries all over the place. Everybody seemed to know Chubby, but nobody had seen him lately. Two weeks passed, and by this time I had searched every likely place in the neighbourhood and had gone in the quiet of the evenings and listened and called outside any place where he might possibly have got shut up. But never a sight nor sound of Chubby. Three weeks went by. We had advertised his loss in the papers, and all the dustmen and the sweepers and the lamplighters and the postmen were on the lookout for him now. Ever since he had lived in London, Chubby had worn a thin leather collar round his neck, on which I had written his address in ink. How I wish that I had had a properly engraved plate on the collar, then whoever found him would be sure to read where he came from. The ink would probably have got smudged out by now, I thought. Four weeks passed. Five weeks passed. We had done everything we could think of to find out what had become of our chubby. But he was still missing, and we were beginning to give up hope of seeing him again. We were afraid that he had either got run over, or else someone had deliberately stolen him. I wished again and again that I had had his name and address engraved on his collar. If only I could know the end of him know that he was not in pain, not suffering anywhere. I could not bear to see the steps where Chubby used to sit and hold his receptions, nor could I bear to look at the grating of the cellar through which he used to squeeze himself, turning his face sideways and getting first one cheek through and then the other, because his face was too fat to go in front ways. It seemed dreadful to think that I might never see him again in these old haunts of his. Even his quarrelsome friend seemed to be missing him, and went about with a depressed air. He had not had a good quarrel for five weeks. One morning there came a knock at the front door. 
It was a girl who said she had come from an ABC tea shop in the Strand. We saw an advertisement. You have lost a big cat, haven't you? She said. Have you found it yet? No. Well, a big cat, a very big cat, ran into our shop the other day. Right up onto the top floor he went, and he has stayed there ever since. My heart began to beat rapidly. How long ago when he first ran in? I asked eagerly. About three weeks, said the girl. We've only just seen your advertisement. It's a very big cat. I'll come at once, I said, and within a few minutes I had reached the ABC shop. Right up on the top floor, said the manageress, smiling. He won't come down. Seems very frightened. We don't know where he came from. We have been feeding him, of course, but we can't keep him. I do hope he's yours. I flew up the stairs to the top floor. In a small back room was a pile of boxes. He's got behind there, said the girl who had come up with me. Tom, Tom, she said. But as he did not appear, you call him, she suggested. Chubby, Chubby, I called, and my voice sounded strange to me. It was quite hoarse with excitement. But the cat would not come out. I'll see if I can get him, said the girl, and she began to scramble behind the boxes. Here he is. Come along, old fellow. There's nothing to be afraid of and she lifted up a great big tabby cat with white paws, a nose that was half white, and a black back. It was not chubby. My heart sank with disappointment. It was not chubby, but it was the smooge. Of course, I didn't recognise the smooge immediately. I was so full of disappointment. All I saw was a monster cat, homeless, frightened, a cat who was not chubby. I shook my head. It's not my cat, I said. Oh, I'm sorry, said the girl. We shall have to ask the cat's home to send someone to fetch this one away then. He's a beautiful cat. It seems a shame, I said, stroking the smooge's smooth head. The smooge rubbed his head timidly against my hand, looking up into my face with big, appealing eyes. Yes, it does seem a shame, the girl agreed. He's such an unusual size. I've never seen such a big cat. I wish I could take him home myself, but I couldn't. And we can't keep him here, the manageress says. Wouldn't you like him yourself? But I did not want another cat in place of Chubby. What could I do for the smooge, I wondered. Could I find a good home for him? He was really such a magnificent cat. It would be a shame to destroy him. I might be able to find a good home for him, I said, gently stroking the cat's head. The smooge was still looking up with his pleading eyes. I will find a good home for him, I said. And so it came about that the smooge came home with me inside the big basket that I had taken with me to hold Chubby. The smooge seemed to dislike baskets, and directly he was inside and the lid closed, he began a melancholy meow, which he kept up without stopping all along the strand and to my flat. People turned their heads as we passed them, hearing the smooge's voice. I was very glad when we reached home and I could let him out. He stopped crying immediately the lid of the basket was raised. I gave him some milk, but he didn't want that. He rubbed his head against my hand and began to purr. Then he made a thorough inspection of the flat, walking in a dignified, though slightly nervous manner, from room to room, hastening back every time I spoke to him to rub his head against me again and make funny little purry noises. Having satisfied himself about the flat, he came and jumped on my knee and made a great fuss of me, purring and rubbing and digging his claws in and out of my dress. He was saying thank you as plainly as he knew how. We soon became aware that he had very good manners. 
so well behaved was he that it was obvious somebody had taken the trouble to teach him all kinds of nice little ways he had evidently been somebody's pet poor somebody who had lost him perhaps as i had lost chubby so we kept the smooge a few days and i made inquiries and found a good home for him but we did not send him at once we kept him a few more days he was so lovable and so grateful and had such nice ways with him i don't want him instead of chubby i said but if only chubby would come back i would keep both the smooge had been with us about a fortnight and chubby had been missing just seven weeks when my maid came in early one morning and told me that she believed there was a cat down in the coal cellar chubby's old cellar where he used to squeeze his face through the bars she could hear it crying it sounds like like chubby she said oh it can't be i said not daring to let myself hope but supposing it is supposing it is raced excitedly through my head he might have come back in the night and got into his old cellar to sleep but why was he crying there why didn't he come up no it couldn't be chubby it must be a strange cat i was just getting up when the maid hastened to me with the news and while i hastily flung on some clothes she went down to the cellar with a candle and keys in a second i heard her come rushing up again and i dashed out into the passage just in time to see a cat disappear quickly into the dining-room he's come up he's come up and run in there she gasped almost setting her apron on fire with the lighted candle in her excitement i darted into the dining-room there in the middle of the floor stood a big dusty tabby cat with great fat cheeks it was chubby chubby i cried i could hardly believe my eyes there he was as fat as ever where had he been for seven whole weeks Durr, arr, arr, said chubby in his old familiar way oh chubby chubby i said as i picked him up in my arms he rubbed his old head against me and purred and said Durr, arr, arr over and over again and then he caught sight of the smooge who was watching him large-eyed from the corner of the couch durr, arr, arr, said chubby again quite willing to be friends the smooge growled i am sorry to say he didn't know that this was chubby's home but thought he was some dusty stranger who had no right in the place but before the day was out chubby must have explained matters to him he was thr -r -r -ing in his friendly talkative way to everything and everybody all that day for the two of them struck up a friendship that has lasted ever since the first thing i did after chubby's return was to buy him a new collar with his name and address engraved on it his old collar was still round his neck when he returned but the ink marks on it had worn away it was three years ago that chubby disappeared and he has never gone away again we have never found out where he was during those seven weeks someone must have taken him in we think meaning to keep him but chubby got out and came home whoever had him treated him well for he came back as fat as when he went away after his return he quickly took up all his old ways and habits including his naughty trick of sharpening his claws on the bookcase when he wanted the door open and nobody was taking any notice of him he knew well that the sound would gain him attention at once and would look round over his shoulder while sharpening his claws to see how quickly i was coming chubby and smooge gave a christmas party this year there was only one guest at the party it is true and a very small guest at that but what the party lacked in quantity it made up for in quality the guest was a small tabby kitten that lived near by and a nicer mannered little kitten it would be difficult to find to begin with as a little gift to his hosts he brought a tin of sardines with him a whole tin 
not middle carts at sixpence halfpenny a tin, but whole sardines in a whole tin, which was very handsome of him, considering that Chubby and Smooge wouldn't have known the difference. His mistress, who brought the little kitten, introduced him to his hosts by the curious name of Itty Man. Smooge seemed rather impressed by this, but Chubby's attention was entirely absorbed for the moment by the sight of the sardine tin. He followed it with a loving gaze, and as soon as it was opened he and Smooge set two on their share. They never quarrelled over their food. But, I'm very sorry to have to tell you, they spat at Itty Man. Itty Man arched his little back and his tail went thick, and he stood watching them while they went steadily on with their share of the party. It was very low-mannered of his hosts, and I'm afraid there is no excuse, except that they had never seen such a very small kitten before, and did not know the proper way to treat him. However, Itty Man behaved like a perfect little gentleman, and went quietly on with his bit of the party in a corner by himself. After the choice meal was over, Chubby took charge of the tin. He didn't say, after you, to the smooge, because he knew there would be no after. And he licked it, and licked it round and round the room until it was so clean and shiny that Itty Man could see his own reflection in it. Then Chubby washed his own face, and Smoogey washed his own face, and then they both jumped up on the couch and washed each other's faces and then they went to sleep, leaving their tiny guest disconsolate to entertain himself as best he could, which he did by going to sleep himself on the rug before the fire. I'm afraid Chubby and Smooge are not very good as hosts, but they have never given a party before, so did not know what was expected of them. Yet Chubby knew what was expected of him when holding his receptions at the top of the steps in the court, for one morning he was sitting on top of the steps as usual. It was a Sunday morning, and King George and Queen Mary passed the door on their way from a church nearby. Chubby immediately set up his meow of welcome, and then, evidently feeling that it was a special occasion and one on which something more was expected of him, he got up and, descending the steps leisurely, followed the royal party through the court. A journalist friend of Chubby happened to see the incident, and something in Chubby's behaviour so took his fancy that he wrote a short notice about it for his paper. I was very surprised when reading my paper the following day to come across a paragraph headed Cat Follows the Queen, which began Chubby, the largest and most famous cat in the neighbourhood of blank, and told the story. The next morning I heard the dustman call out to Chubby as he passed him sitting in his usual place. Hello, Chubby. So you're the cat that was stroked by the Queen, are you? And so the story grew, until it was quite evident that before the incident was forgotten, it would be said that Chubby had paid a visit to Buckingham Palace and the Queen had invited him to have a drink of milk out of her saucer. For a time the postman used to greet him with, Hello? Here's the royal cat. But he has gone back to his original nickname for him now and says, Hello, you old rascal, just as he used to do. The smooge listens to all this in wide-eyed wonder and is glad when Chubby has done holding a reception on the steps and comes in to sleep on the couch. For then the smooge jumps up and curls round beside him and uses Chubby as a pillow. End of chapter 15。Chapter 16 of The House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro。Chapter 16 – Jenny Meets the Littlest One In the room next to Peter Bollen, Jenny heard somebody singing. The door was partly open, and as she passed, Peter Bollen himself looked up from the window seat where he was sitting and saw her. Ah, little lady, he called, come in and meet a friend of mine. Jenny needed no second invitation. I just popped in from my room to see how he was getting on, 
explained Peter Bollin, inclining his head toward a very small, curly-headed boy on his knee. He's staying here for a week, he went on. And when Miss Primrose isn't looking after him, I am. Now then, old man, he said to the boy, this is Jenny. Stand up and shake hands with her. The little boy slid off Peter Bollin's knee and held out his hand to Jenny. He was very shy, shyer even than Jenny. After they had shaken hands solemnly, Peter Bollin made room for Jenny on the window seat. Tell Jenny about that game you were playing the other day, urged Peter Bollin. The little boy hid his face shyly against Peter Bollin's sleeve. So Peter Bollin went on talking to Jenny, until by and by the little boy raised his head and, looking up at Jenny, smiled. Then, when he found nobody was taking any notice, he sat up and began to talk. And that was how Jenny presently learnt all about the old witch and the woolly mat and the unfortunate affair with the postman. The Woolly Mat I'm tending I'm a woolly mat, I'm lying on the floor, till someone comes and treads on me outside the parlour door. I'm tending that an ugly witch has put a spell on me, cos really I'm a little boy, I mean I used to be. I hope its mother finds me first and comes along this way. Her shoes tread very soft and light, I wonder what she'll say. I hope she'll take and lay me down beside her chair at tea, cos people might drop bits of cake on woolly mats like me. I hope she'll take, but shh, who's this that's coming up the stair? A clopty clop, it sounds like Jane, but I don't really care. Although I wist it wasn't Jane, her shoes tread awful hard, and ooh, she sometimes picks up mats and beats them in the yard. I think I'll tend the nuggly witch has changed me back again, cos she wouldn't like for me to stay and get trod on by Jane. The Postman Calls Me Tuppany The Postman Calls Me Tuppany Or, hello, half past four Or something different every time he comes up to our door I wist he wouldn't do it, cos he knows the name's not right. But when I tell him this, he only shuts one eye up tight. And next time when he comes, he says, I've got a parcel here, addressed to Master Tuppany. Now where has it gone, dear, dear? He feels about inside his bag. Whatever shall I do? I must have lost it. Still, of course, it can't have been for you. You say your name's not Tuppany. And he laughs and goes away. And I wist he hadn't done it. Now I don't know what to say, if he should find the parcel, cos I feel I ought to see, in case, although it's not my name, the parcel's meant for me. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of the House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro. Chapter Seventeen Old Mrs. Bunch's Tale. Old Mrs. Bunch looked kindly at Jenny out of her small beady eyes. I suppose you're wondering who cracked that mirror hanging over there on the wall. Well, I bought it the other day, and there's a story about it, and a queer story too, I can tell you. Don't tell me it's unlucky to buy a cracked mirror, because I shan't believe you. Unlucky? Fiddlesticks! Jenny had not been going to say anything of the kind. I love stories. Would you tell it me? she begged. Mrs Bunch's eyes twinkled. I've got it written down somewhere, just as the mirror told it me. Told it you? echoed Jenny in a surprised voice. 
That's what I said, wasn't it? Mrs. Bunge began fumbling about her skirt as she went on. It's written on a bit of paper in one of my pockets. I always have three pockets in every skirt. One to put things into, one to take things out of, and one for threepenny pieces. Ah, here it is. Now turn on that light, little girl, and come over here on the sofa by me, and I'll read this story out to you. So saying, she unfolded a little packet of paper in her hands, put on her spectacles, and began to read. The Cracked Mirror Of course, if I'd got what I deserved, mused the cracked gold-framed mirror that was leaning against a bedpost in the dusty lumber-room, I should be down in the drawing-room surrounded by a wreath of laurels and an admiring household instead of packed away in this wretched hole. It's a horribly unjust world. Here am I, banished because I am worthy of a VC, and there's Florence, who's never done anything in her life but hold umbrellas and hats, down in the hall living a life of gaiety in the centre of everything and everybody. She's all very well as hat stands go, but she never had half the attention from visitors that I used to have, and she's disgracefully ignorant. I remember she used to think that VC stood for vacuum cleaner. I laughed so much at her stupidity that I made my nail loose. But in spite of her ignorance, she was very sympathetic, was Florence. How she would creak her joints if she could see me now. Ah, me, what pleasant little gossips we used to have together when I hung in the hall and how she would laugh at my jokes, laugh till the hats fell off her fingers. And I remember I would catch the rays from the electric light and throw them on her of an evening, just for fun. Poor thing, how they used to tickle her. She always was ticklish, was Florence. Well, I was going to tell you about the deed that I ought to have got a VC for, wasn't I? It was one of the noblest deeds you can imagine. One very foggy evening the family were all having dinner and Florence and I were chatting quietly together when the dining-room door opened and Master Tom came out with a letter in his hand and went out of the front door to the post. After he had come back and gone into the dining-room again, I remember I said to Florence, "'He hasn't shut the front door properly.' And she couldn't contradict me because the fog was beginning to creep in. Then suddenly we saw the door slowly open wider and wider, and then a face came round the side and glanced hurriedly up and down the empty hall and staircase. And it was a face, unshaven, wild-eyed, with bent nose and a fringe of hair straggling across the forehead. Another minute, and the man was standing on the hall mat. His clothes were in keeping with his face. They were simply a mass of rags. I looked across at Florence and said, This is outrageous! What does the brute want? But Florence only said, Poor fellow! Isn't he thin? And that remark will just show you what an absolutely idiotic, sentimental creature Florence was. I was too disgusted to reply. Then everything happened with a rush. The man grabbed some silver ornaments off a shelf in the hall, took a couple of silver-handled umbrellas away from Florence and a cloth cap off one of her fingers, and crossed to unhook a small silver photo frame hanging on the wall beneath me. I realised that the matter was urgent, and my mind worked rapidly as I sought for some plan to thwart the thief. I looked across at Florence, but of course she had no ideas. Poor thing, she was completely bewildered, and I expected her to go off into hysterics every minute. Then it happened. Then I did the noble deed. The man raised his head with a jerk, and I caught him a blow with the bottom of my frame, such a blow that I raised myself off the nail that I'd loosened with laughing, and fell with a crash to the floor. Of course, there was a scuttle in the dining-room at once. The door was flung open and they all rushed out. 
Meanwhile, the man, with a terrified exclamation, dropped all the things and dashed out of the front door into the fog. Some of them ran after him, but they never got him, worse luck. And when they picked me up, they found a huge crack right across my face. And one of them said, Well, there's one consolation. If the burglar hadn't caught his head on this thing, he'd have got away with our silver. They actually gave the credit of giving the alarm to the burglar. There's ingratitude for you. And then they talk about consolation and stick me away in a fusty lumber room when I saved all their whole silver and probably their lives. You never know. When I think of what a favourite I used to be in the old days, I can't imagine how everyone is managing to get on without me. Everyone used to look at me when I hung in the hall, and most of them smiled and patted their hair and ties as they passed me. I remember having an argument about this once with the hall mat. He was a spiteful creature. He'd had his feelings trodden on so much, I suppose. And he said it was themselves, not me, they were looking at and admiring. The idea! I don't know when I laughed so much. I couldn't help being beautiful instead of brown and bristly like a hall mat, and I couldn't help people admiring me, could I? There was one pretty little fair girl with blue eyes who used to pass through the hall very frequently. Yes, I know they were blue. I had an argument with Florence about the matter, I recollect, and Florence got quite nasty because I wouldn't say her eyes were grey. Anyway, this little girl was very fond of me. She always looked at me and smiled as she went past. Sometimes she would stand in front of me for a long time, looking at me. And one day she threw me a kiss. Even the whole mat liked this little girl, but his was a selfish reason. She used to wear rubber heels on her shoes and they didn't hurt him so much when she wiped her feet on him. One evening... All the family were going out to a party. And I'd just finished throwing electric light rays at Florence, and she was giggling away, when one by one the family came down the stairs with cloaks and shawls on, and stood in the hall waiting. And by and by the mother called, Do hurry up, Marjorie! What a time you've been getting ready! Then the little blue-eyed girl appeared at the top of the stairs, and she was white, and her voice trembled as she said, Oh, mother, look what I've done. And she held out a white silk dress with a big hole burnt in the middle of it. Everybody started talking at once, and when they'd quieted down a bit, Marjorie told them how she'd been tidying herself at the looking-glass over the mantelpiece in her bedroom, and she'd stood on the fender, and her dress had got burnt by the fire. Her mother told her it was only what she had known would happen some day, because she was always in front of that looking-glass. Then everybody started talking together again. In the end, they all went off to the party, and Marjorie was left behind with her spoilt dress. She hadn't got another one ready to go in. She stood on the hall mat and waved them a careless goodbye, but when the door was shut, she turned round and came up to me. I hate you! I hate you! I hate you! she cried, looking straight at me, and the tears were streaming down her face. You vain, stupid thing! And she turned and fled up the stairs. I was never so amazed in my life. Why should she hate me? Then it dawned on me that what the hall mat had suggested might be true. Just this once. She was looking at herself, not me, on this occasion. But that is the only time the hall mat has ever been right about anything. The other times she was looking at me. I'm sure she was. Oh, when are they coming to fetch me out of this disgusting lumber room? They might at least have lent me against a wall instead of the top of an iron bedstead with three casters off. Old Mrs Bunch folded up the paper. In the end they sold the poor thing, she said, and I bought it on account of its handsome frame. Only I don't want it to know that. 
One of these days, when I've saved up enough thrupney pieces, I shall have new glass put in and hang it up in my hall. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of the House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro. Chapter Eighteen Nanny Remembers. An old lady lived in the room at the very end of the corridor. An old lady with white hair and a face all over wrinkles. She seemed terribly old to Jenny, but she had a smile that was young and so Jenny was not afraid of her. Jenny had pretended that there was an old lady in this room, an old lady who had been a governess, but the old lady she actually found living in this room had not been a governess. She had been a nurse, so Jenny heard Aunt Abby say. It was not until she went in one day with a small parcel that had just come by post for the old lady that Jenny discovered whose nurse she had been. "'She hasn't forgotten me,' said the old lady in a quavering voice as she took the parcel with shaky fingers. "'She never forgets, bless her heart, though it's many a year since I did anything for her.' As she opened the parcel she went on talking, nodding and blinking and smiling at Jenny. "'Wait a bit, wait a bit, little girl. Don't go away for a minute.' I remember her so well when she was your age. Nanny, she said to me last time I saw her, three weeks, no, four weeks ago yesterday I saw her. Nanny, she says, you must go down home. We always called this place home. You must go down home, she says, and have a good rest. It's what you want. There's a room all ready. So I came down here, my dear. She had opened the parcel by this time. There now, she went on, taking out a pair of black woollen mittens. What do you think of that? Just what I wanted and all. She never forgets. The old lady blinked at Jenny. It's my birthday, she announced in her thin, whispery voice. She never forgets. Oh, said Jenny, I... I hope you will have many happy returns. The old lady stretched out her arms and Jenny went shyly forward and kissed her wrinkled cheek. When my Miss Clare was your age, began the old lady. Miss Clare, exclaimed Jenny, starting back. Yes, my dear, I was Miss Clare's nurse when she was a little girl like you and a sweet, lovable little thing she was, in spite of her willful ways. I remember. The Girl in the Picture I remember Miss Clare when she was nine years old, with her golden curls brushed and shining, a prettier sight it would have been impossible to find. There was a picture made of her about that time, all in a dainty white frock she was, and with that new doll of hers held in her arms. It used to hang in the drawing-room beside the mantelpiece. I wonder where it is now. I know, said Jenny, up on the wall in the twisting passage. Well, to be sure, exclaimed Nanny, and is it indeed? Her parents gave her the doll on her ninth birthday. What did she call it now? Ah, I remember, Lady Barbara. She was to have had Lady Barbara given to her on the previous Christmas, but she did something naughty, and her father, instead of letting her have it, put it away in a box, and it was kept till her birthday. She was full of courage, was Miss Clare, and not afraid to own up if she had been in the wrong and she was not afraid of her father's punishments until after she had Lady Barbara. I'll tell you why in a minute. Many a battle of wills I'd seen take place between her and her father, before Lady Barbara came. He was a very stubborn man when his temper was aroused, and she took after him. I've seen the two of them stand facing each other, white-faced and silent, and neither of them would give in an inch. 
it was not the proper way to bring up a child, in my opinion. She ought not to have been bullied and then allowed to argue with her father as she did. If only her parents had understood her a little, if only they had tried to win her affection. But there, it doesn't matter what I thought. Nanny, Nanny, she would say, running up to me in the nursery and throwing her arms round my neck. I've broken father's telescope. He told me not to touch it, and I did. Don't mind, Nanny. Don't be sad. And off she would go to her father to confess what she had done. She always begged me not to mind, because I used to say how sad it made me when she was naughty. Miss Clare is to go to bed at six o'clock tonight, her father would come striding in to tell me. She's been a very naughty girl. But Miss Clare was a curious child. Although she would own up and accept a punishment, she was too proud ever to admit that it was a punishment. I want to go to bed, she would say about six o'clock. I'm tired. And off she would go to bed without any more ado. Clare is not to come with me to the garden party, her mother said on another occasion. She was so disobedient this morning, I shall leave her at home. And so Miss Clare was left behind. I'm very glad I'm not going. I didn't want to go a bit, she said, and began to hum a little tune as she tapped with her fingers on the window pane and watched her mother drive away. But when it came to Christmas time, and her father showed her the beautiful doll, and then put it away, I think she cared that time. Not that she would admit it. Oh, no, she didn't want the doll at all, she gave us to understand. She had been extra naughty on that occasion. Indeed, through her naughtiness a small cousin of hers had nearly been killed. Again and again she had been told not to open the garden gates and take this small cousin out along the main road. But she did, and the little cousin was knocked down by a cart, bruised and very frightened, but, as good fortune would have it, not injured seriously. There was a terrible scene with Miss Clare's father that day. Miss Clare's Christmas present was packed up and put away. The cousin was taken home, and Miss Clare was left to amuse herself over Christmas as best she could. I found her crying in bed on Christmas Eve. But she said it was because her feet were cold, not because her father had told her that Father Christmas was not coming to her that year on account of her naughtiness. She hung up her stockings in spite of her father's words, but on Christmas morning she found them empty. About that time she invented a new game for herself. I don't quite know what it was all about, but she was constantly running up and down the long twisting passage, the one outside my door here, running up and down and talking in whispers to herself. Why, it's like the game I was playing out there, said Jenny, only I was playing with Miss Clare. What? said Nanny. Playing with Miss Clare? But you couldn't. So Jenny had to explain all about it. Ah, said Nanny, nodding her head. I see. I shouldn't wonder if Miss Clare wasn't playing that game too. When her birthday came and she got her doll at last, the way she cared for it. All day long she was nursing it and dressing and undressing it and talking to it. She'd wanted it all the time, that was plain to see. She was a good enough little soul with me on the whole, if only her father hadn't been quite such a strict man. He was always finding fault with her. Neither he nor her mother seemed much interested in the child, except when she was naughty. She was their only child, too. The father's thoughts were taken up a good deal with his business affairs, and the mother went out and entertained a lot. So you might say Miss Clare had a lonely childhood. Of course, she had me, but that's different. However, her loneliness seemed over when her doll arrived. She was happy and occupied all the day long with it. 
and then one day her father found out that the only way really to punish miss clare was to threaten to take her doll away and shut it in a cupboard for a week shall i ever forget the child's face the first time he did this to me it seemed a shame to punish her through the doll the one thing she had to care for however it doesn't matter what i used to think the first time her father used this new way of punishing her was one day when Miss Clare had got into the library, where she was forbidden on account of her carelessness, and had accidentally damaged a book on which her father set great store. I remember hearing her father coming with his heavy tread up the stairs. He flung the nursery door wide open. Clare! he cried, and his voice was very angry. In his hand he held the damaged book. "'I was just coming to tell you, father,' she said. "'Just coming to tell me,' repeated her father. "'Haven't you been told again and again not to go into the library and touch my books?' His eyes flashed round the room and rested on me. I was sitting by the window sewing a tiny button on Lady Barbara's frock, while her ladyship reclined elegantly on my knee. He paused, then, "'Nurse, give me Miss Clare's doll,' he said. Immediately Miss Clare sprang to her feet. "'Father, what are you going to do?' she cried, and there was fear in her voice. "'Don't do anything to Lady Barbara. Please, please don't. I'll never touch your books again. Indeed I won't.' At this her father's eyes gleamed strangely. He recognised that through her love for her doll he had some power over her at last. "'Give me the doll,' he said again to me. What could I do? I handed it to him in silence. He took it roughly and strode toward the door. "'Father, oh, what are you going to do?' implored Miss Clare, following him. "'I'm going to shut this doll of yours up in the hall cupboard for a week, on the top shelf.' "'and I shall keep the key of the door in my pocket,' he said. "'We heard his heavy footsteps descending the stairs. "'Miss Clare stood quite still for a second. "'Then she burst into tears. "'It was the first time I had ever seen her cry "'over one of her father's punishments. "'The sight was so unusual that I got up at once "'and put my arms about her. "'Don't cry, honey.' I said, forgetting how naughty she had been. But even if I had remembered, I dare say I should have done the same. I had always a soft spot in my heart for my Miss Clare. "'It's not fair! It's not fair!' she sobbed. "'It's not fair to lock Lady Barbara in the cupboard. She hasn't done anything. It's me that ought to be locked in, not her. Oh, and she'll be so frightened of the dark!' It made my heart ache to hear the way she cried. She clung to me for a bit, then she rushed off to find her father and beg him to lock her in the cupboard instead of Lady Barbara. But her father was firm. He would do nothing of the kind, he said. For a week Lady Barbara should remain in the cupboard, in the dark, and then, providing she had been good all the week, Clare should have her back again. In vain Clare pleaded with him. The next day, knowing that Miss Clare had lain awake half the night crying, I went down and spoke to her father myself, fearing the child would cry herself ill. It was no use. "'It is the only way to teach her,' said her father, and her mother agreed. On my way upstairs I met Miss Clare coming hurriedly down. "'Where are you going?' I asked her, alarmed at the look on her face. Nanny, she said, I'm going to get a hammer and I'm going to smash the cupboard door open and get my poor Lady Barbara out. It took me some time to talk her out of this, but I did it. I told her that I feared if she did anything of the kind, the doll might be taken away from her altogether. And at last she gave up the idea and sat beside me for a time on the window-seat in the nursery. But after a while she got up and went down into the passage, and I heard her running up and down, up and down, and talking to herself. 
After this, Miss Clare went and sat on a little stool outside the hall cupboard for an hour or so each day, reading or doing her lessons. And every now and then she would whisper through the crack of the door to Lady Barbara. And each evening at bedtime she would always go and whisper good night, and tell Lady Barbara not to be frightened, because nothing would hurt her. It was a bad week for Miss Clare. The joy in her face when she got Lady Barbara back at the end of it made the tears spring to my eyes. But her father merely said, Now remember, Clare, whenever you are naughty in future, that doll goes into the cupboard here for a week. Miss Clare seemed to be good for a long time after this. But one day she did something, a little trifling thing before some visitors, which displeased her father, and the doll was taken away again. But there was no third time. One afternoon she came flying upstairs into the nursery, her face dead white. Nanny, she gasped, quick, where is Lady Barbara? She snatched the doll up in her arms and was out of the room again before I could say a word. Five minutes later she came back and sat quietly down by the fire. Her father came up immediately afterward and the expression on his face made me tremble for my Miss Clare. Clare, he cried, you've been across those rose beds again. The gardener saw you and you've broken that prize rose bush. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to really, truly I didn't, said Miss Clare earnestly. I forgot. Just for a little minute I did. I was in a hurry to get onto the white path on the other side, and my foot slipped in the soil, and... That's enough, said her father. I'm so sorry, so sorry, father, really. What's the good of being sorry? You always are sorry when you've done the mischief. Her father shut his mouth in a tight line. But I really didn't mean, began Miss Clare imploringly. "'Where's that doll of yours?' demanded her father. "'And let me tell you this is your last chance, Clare. "'Next time you shall not have the doll back at all, so I warn you. "'I'm tired of your disobedience. Give me that doll at once.' "'Miss Clare made no movement. "'Nurse!' her father turned to me. "'I looked round. "'I don't know where it is, sir,' I said. "'Clare!' said her father again. Give me that doll. Miss Clare still made no movement, but there was the light of battle in her eyes. She lifted her head and looked her father squarely in the face. If you're angry with me, father, she said, you must punish me, not Lady Barbara. She hasn't done anything. I can't, I can't bear her to be locked up. Give me that doll, quick was all her father replied. Miss Clare sat perfectly still. Clare! shouted her father angrily. No, I won't give her to you, cried Miss Clare in a passion. She shan't be punished. She shan't. I've hidden her somewhere where you'll never find her. You'll never find her. So lock me in the cupboard instead. Her father was furious with her. Nurse! he said, find that doll for me, I insist. And he began looking about himself. Of course I had to get up and help, but Miss Clare sat by the fire trembling with excitement. After we had searched the nursery, we went out into the passage and searched the other rooms on the same landing. The end room was a sort of box room, hardly ever used, full of old furniture and boxes. As I turned into this room, I noticed marks in the dust on the boxes near the door. My heart sank. I was afraid I was on the track. I came to the fireplace and looked about. And then, peeping down from the corner of the chimney, was a corner of Lady Barbara's dress. She was wrapped all up in an old black shawl, but a corner of her dress was peeping out. I stretched out my hand then let it drop to my side. I turned my eyes away as if I had seen nothing, and I went on searching. 
Outside the door, Miss Clare's father said to me, "'Well, we won't waste any more time, nurse, "'but you find out from her where it is. "'I must have it. "'It's the only way to teach her.' Fortunately, a visitor on business came for him at that moment, and he was obliged to hurry away downstairs. I don't know what would have happened next, but that night Miss Clare's father was taken suddenly ill. They said the visitor had brought bad business news, which had upset him, and helped to bring on an attack, a kind of fit or something. Anyway, all thoughts of Lady Barbara and Miss Clare's punishment were forgotten in the general upheaval that followed. He was ill for many months, and then was taken abroad for a long time, so Miss Clare and her Lady Barbara were left in peace. Miss Clare was left in my charge. Of course she was naughty at times, but I could always manage her. She had an affectionate little heart, really, if only her parents had discovered it. At length Miss Clare had to go away to boarding school. The day before she went, she dressed Lady Barbara up in her best clothes and put her carefully away in a drawer, in which she made a little chink with a penknife so that Lady Barbara shouldn't be left entirely in the dark, and told her that she would think of her every day till the holidays came, and that she would never, never forget her. When the holidays came, Miss Clare made a rare fuss of Lady Barbara, but when the next holidays came... She did not get her out of the drawer until she had been home for two days. And at last came one holiday, when she forgot to take her out of the drawer at all. And so the years went by. Changes were made in the house, many changes, and Lady Barbara was packed away in the nursery cupboard with all the other toys, and forgotten. "'Oh, how could Miss Clare have forgotten her?' said Jenny. She had had her day, said Nanny. But I could never have forgotten Lady Barbara altogether, sighed Jenny. Yes, you could, said the old nurse. Things that at one time you think you cannot live without, you find you can live without. And if it wasn't so, it would be impossible to go on living at all. I don't suppose you believe me. But when you are older, you will find I am right. But though Miss Clare may have forgotten all about Lady Barbara, she has never forgotten her old nurse, bless her heart. And these mittens she sent me for my birthday will be a rare comfort. Poor Lady Barbara. I wonder what became of her. I know, said Jenny. She is upstairs in the old nursery cupboard. I have played with her. And she went on to tell Nanny all about it. I always tell her Miss Clare has not forgotten her, and she hasn't. My Miss Clare hasn't. Nanny shook her head and smiled. My Miss Clare has, she said. End of chapter 18「Chapter Nineteen of the House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro. Chapter Nineteen. Phil the Fiddler's Story. If you don't like fairy tales, shut the door and go away, said Phil the Fiddler, running his fingers through his long white hair and placing his flute on the mantelpiece. Jenny still called him Phil the Fiddler, because he was just as she had imagined him, only he played a flute instead of a violin. "'But I do like fairy tales, please,' said Jenny shyly, standing on one leg by the open door. "'Then come in, dearie, and I'll tell you one,' said the old gentleman, sinking down into a big armchair and patting one of the padded arms." Jenny closed the door and came and sat on the arm of the chair. "'Well, it's not exactly a fairy tale,' the old gentleman went on, "'because there are no fairies in it. "'But there are witches and dwarves and strange brown canvas bags "'and a little girl, a bit older than you, dearie. "'And the story is called The Bag of Dreams.'" The Bag of Dreams 
tap, 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 tap against the window pane. Annette's grandmother moved uneasily in her chair by the fire and stuck the needle quicker and quicker in and out of the brown canvas she was sewing. Tomorrow I'll get that creeper cut for sure, she muttered, glancing sideways at her little granddaughter, who was sitting reading in the chimney corner. How the gale rattles it against the window! Annette remembered her grandmother making these remarks times without number, and yet when the morrow came, nothing was done to the creeper. And then one day, Annette discovered that the creeper did not grow near enough to the window to tap against it, even on the stormiest night. She made this discovery on the day before her thirteenth birthday. She and her grandmother lived alone in a little cottage on the top of a windswept hill. Annette was a lonely, dreamy little thing who had to depend on herself or her books for entertainment as she was forbidden to go down to the village at the bottom of the hill and play with the children there. Her grandmother taught her to read and write and sew, but she hated sewing and much preferred to read. Long hours she would spend on the side of the hill with a storybook for company and though she longed sometimes to go down and speak to the children she could see in the village far below, she never disobeyed her grandmother, because she was very much afraid of her. Always, it seemed to Annette, her grandmother was sitting by the fire sewing brown canvas and muttering to herself. She told Annette once that she was making bags, which she sold, and so earned a little money to keep them both in food and fuel. Annette was quite satisfied. She asked few questions of her grandmother. Then, the day before her thirteenth birthday, Annette was sitting on the hillside reading as usual when the sound of voices floated clearly up to her on the still air. Two of the villagers gathering violets had wandered further up than usual. There, let's turn back now. I never go further up than this because of the old witch on the top, said one. Very well, said the other. My basket's nearly full anyhow. By the way, what has become of that little grandchild of the old witch? I haven't seen her on the hill lately. I suppose she's never allowed to come down and mix with other children in case she finds out what her grandmother is before she is meant to know. Folk do say that she is going to become a witch too some day. What do you think? Their voices died away in the distance, leaving Annette very frightened at what she had overheard, though she could scarcely believe that it was true. However, she hastened home to find out. But when she saw her grandmother sitting by the fire sewing, she felt afraid to tell her what she had heard in case it made her angry. So Annette determined to wait and watch and listen. Annette wandered away in the garden to think things over. She began to remember how curiously her grandmother watched her whenever the tapping sounded on the window pane. And then, for the first time, she noticed that the creeper could not touch the window, and marvelled that she had never found this out before. But of course she had never had the slightest suspicion until now. She tried to recall anything else that was curious in her grandmother's behaviour but she could think of nothing except that one of the stairs creaked very loudly as she, Annette, went up to bed every night, and that her grandmother always left the kitchen door ajar until she heard her tread on this stair, and then called good night and shut the door. After this, Annette always became dead tired immediately, and, tumbling up the last few stairs and into bed, remembered nothing more till she awoke in the morning. Being in a suspicious mood, Annette wondered if this stare was connected with her sudden tiredness of a night, though she had never thought of anything of the kind before. Anyway, I won't tread on it tonight, just to see if it makes any difference, she made up her mind. But I will take a thick stick with me and push the stare so that Grandmother shall hear it creak, and then I will find out what she does when she thinks I am asleep. So the stair creaked as usual when Annette went up to bed that night, and her grandmother, with her ear to the crack of the kitchen door, chuckled and closed the door quite satisfied. Annette crept up to her bedroom and sat for a while by the open window, listening. 
she did not feel the least bit sleepy, and was glad that she had discovered the reason of her sudden tiredness each night, and at the same time she felt puzzled and vaguely afraid, for it seemed without doubt that her grandmother must be a witch. She could hear her moving about in the kitchen below, and presently there came sounds of chink, 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 as if money were being counted. A lot of money. Annette did not know her grandmother had any money. She had always understood that she was very poor, although she worked so hard at her sewing. After a while Annette heard the back door unfastened, and her grandmother go out into the garden. It was a moonlight night. She could see her from the window, hobbling down the garden path, carrying under her arms several of the brown canvas bags. Suddenly, from out of the shadows by the gate, there appeared four little dwarf men. "'You shouldn't knock so often on the window. She'll begin to suspect,' Annette heard her grandmother say. "'Well, we must have the bags, and we have to remind you we're waiting. You grow slower and slower in making them each day,' grumbled one of the dwarfs. "'What does it matter if she does suspect?' said another. "'You'll be telling her soon.' "'She's thirteen tomorrow,' said the grandmother. "'Time she took over your work, then,' said a third dwarf. "'You're getting old, you know. "'But let's see what you have got for us tonight.' "'They then began to examine the bags "'and to bargain and haggle with the old woman "'as to the price to be paid, "'and very soon they were all five very angry and quarrelsome. "'Shh!' said the fourth dwarf presently. "'Supposing we woke her up?' "'Supposing we fiddlesticks,' snapped Annette's grandmother. "'We couldn't wake her up. "'The stair creaked as usual, I tell you.' "'They resumed their bargaining, "'until finally they came to some decision, "'and the four little dwarfs departed, "'each carrying one of the empty brown canvas bags. "'Annette watched them pass through the gate "'and went their way down the hill "'to a group of trees by the roadside, "'where they disappeared.' Meanwhile, her grandmother came indoors, chuckling, and shut herself in the kitchen. Poor little Annette! What was she to do? It was evidently true, then, that her grandmother was a witch. What dreadful fate awaited herself on the morrow! She wished she knew what those bags were used for, the brown canvas bags that her grandmother was always sewing. I must try to find out, thought Annette. She crept downstairs, carefully missing the stair that creaked, and let herself noiselessly out into the garden. As she passed the kitchen door, she could hear the chinking of money and her grandmother muttering to herself. Once outside, Annette ran quickly down the path, through the gate, and made her way to the place where the dwarfs had disappeared. As she approached, she could hear voices, so she hesitated in the shadow of the first tree. A short distance away she saw the four dwarfs sitting in a circle on the ground, talking earnestly, the bags on the grass beside them. Two of the bags were still flat and empty, but the other two appeared to be partly filled with some strange moving objects. What could be inside them? Annette gazed, fascinated. The dwarfs were evidently finishing a serious discussion. Well, well, what does it matter? said one. Tomorrow little Annette will be told her fate, and then... Poor child, remarked another sympathetically. Why poor child? asked the first speaker irritably. She is so young and fresh and pretty, came the answer. It is sad to think of her sitting always by the fire sewing these dream bags, and growing old and cross and ugly, with no friends, no companion but her grandmother, and shunned by all good folk because she is a witch. Annette shivered and pressed closer to the tree trunk. Very sad, very sad, mocked a third dwarf. But after all, it is her fate and he shrugged his shoulders as if it were no concern of his. "'You must remember that being a witch has its attractions,' the fourth dwarf chimed in. "'Think of the delight of knowing the secret of how to make dream bags. Think of the gold pieces you can earn.' At which they all laughed. 
My word, but the old and does know how to drag the gold pieces out of us. We shall be beggars soon, the prices she charges for these new bags. He pulled a long face, then sprang to his feet. But come along, we must be off. He seized one of the partly filled bags. See, he continued, I've picked up a few already, but there's lots more to do before dawn. Come along. And he moved away. Another dwarf picked up the other partly filled bag, but he was careless, and as he flung it over his shoulder, the cord that tied the opening slipped, and the bag opened. Woo! There's one nearly out. Bother! It's got away! he exclaimed, fastening the bag hastily. Annette, peering, saw something glide from the bag and float away, something that looked like a wisp of grey smoke. It twisted and twirled lazily, rising higher and higher till it disappeared over the treetops. Never mind, it will return at dawn, said the dwarf consolingly to himself as he departed. The third dwarf, with one of the empty bags, followed quickly on the heels of the other two. There remained only the dwarf who had pitied Annette, and he was slowly gathering up his bag. On the impulse of the moment Annette stepped out of the shadow as he moved away and called to him. The dwarf turned quickly and dropped his bag in astonishment. Oh, please, sir, she cried, I'm Annette, and I heard what you said, and oh, I don't want to be a witch, sir. Could you help me, help me to escape? You seemed so kind. Please, please tell me what to do. Why, little Annette, we never guessed you were near. What is it you wish me to do for you? asked the kindly dwarf. Just help me to escape, begged Annette, so that I may never, never see my grandmother again. I am so frightened of her. Alas, said the dwarf, you cannot run away. Your grandmother would always find you and bring you back. It is your fate to become a witch like her and to sit and sew dream bags. Then he went on to tell her how her grandmother, being a witch, had discovered long ago the secret of how to make dream bags, those magic bags in which dreams could be caught. And as it was the business of the dwarfs to catch and distribute dreams, these bags were invaluable to them. When a bag is full of dreams, said the dwarf, we go down among the sleeping children and scatter the dreams about, so that the children dream the dreams that we have caught for them. And when they have finished with a dream and wake up, the dream floats back to us again, and we pack it away in the bags for further use. We can use one dream over and over again, you know, he continued. We have stacks and stacks of bags full of old dreams, but we are always catching new ones as well, so we need fresh bags constantly. They are wonderful dreams, some of them, and wonderful magic bags to hold them and keep them fresh. Think, Annette, it can be good work making these bags if you sow with love in your heart instead of greed, greed for gold. Think how much happiness dreams can give to children. Some people would envy you, you who are fated to learn the secret of sewing dream bags. But I hate sewing, cried Annette, and I'd hate to be a witch and grow old like grandmother. You would make untold wealth, of course, said the dwarf. Your grandmother has. Do you know that she has boxes and sacks full to the brim with gold and silver? Has she? said Annette. But what is the good of it? The dwarf was silent. Oh, sir, is there no escape for me? begged Annette. There is one way out, began the dwarf slowly. Oh, do tell me, broke in Annette eagerly. You could creep inside my bag and become a dream. You would float away away at night into the minds of sleeping children, and play with them, and laugh with them, and make them happy. And when the dawn broke, you would return to the dream bag and rest until the next night. Annette's eyes grew big and round, and she clapped her hands excitedly. Then her face became grave. And should I never be a little girl, like I am now, any more? 
The dwarf shook his head. But it is your only way of escape, he said. You have your choice, and I am risking a great deal in telling you this, but, well, I am sorry for you, little Annette, and think you ought to have a chance. At that moment Annette heard a gate bang loudly, and then the voice of her grandmother calling, Annette, Annette, you naughty girl, where have you got to? Come this instant. Her grandmother had missed her already. Annette peeped out from the trees and saw the old woman coming down the hill. How old and cross and ugly her grandmother looked. How dreadful to grow like that. Annette looked up to the clear night sky and remembered the wisp of smoke floating carelessly away in the air. How free and fresh it must be to be a dream and play with little children like herself until the dawn. Then she looked down at the silent waiting dwarf and the brown canvas bag. Annette, called her grandmother's harsh voice nearby. What a plague the child is! Where can she be hiding? Annette! Annette turned to the dwarf. Open the bag, quick, she said. I have decided. So Annette crept inside the bag and turned into a dream, and her grandmother never saw her any more. And every night Annette floats out and away, and laughs and plays with other little children until the dawn breaks. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of The House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro. Part 3. Jenny's Luck Chapter 20. The Lights Go Out in the Windows The happy times Jenny was having with her friends came to a sudden and unexpected ending on the arrival one morning of Aunt Emma with the swinging earrings. She arrived at half-past twelve in time for luncheon, and at half-past five, as soon as tea was over, she started back for Putney and took Jenny with her. It was in vain that Jenny pleaded with Uncle Nickle to try to persuade Aunt Abby not to send her away. I'm so happy here. Oh, I don't want to go. Uncle Nickle, please, please, she begged. Uncle Nickle took his feet down from the hob and said he would see what could be done, and then went in search of Aunt Abby. But two minutes later he returned, shaking his head. No use, Jenny, my dear, he said. But it's only for a little time you'll be gone. Only a week or so. I'm so afraid, said Jenny that everything, everything won't be the same when I come back. They never are in this world, said Uncle Nickel, sinking into his chair and putting his feet up on the hob again. But I shouldn't worry about that, my dear. Things will change, but don't take no notice of them. I don't. Just look at when this house was all changed, last time you was away. They thought they was going to change me, turn me out of this kitchen, away from the places I like and what I'm used to. But they couldn't do it. I wouldn't take no notice of their changes, but just went on as if nothing had happened. I can't abide change. I like what I'm used to. And I'm going on with what I'm used to, and aren't going to take no notice of them whatsoever. But it's different with you, Uncle Nickel, began Jenny when the voice of Aunt Abby interrupted her. Jenny! Jenny! she called. Come along quick and get your things on, or you'll make your Aunt Emma lose her train. With desperation in her heart, Jenny rushed upstairs and said a hurried goodbye to each of her friends who happened to be in. She left messages for the others. I shall be back again soon, said Jenny. I will see you all when I come back, won't I? But she went away full of doubts and fears in spite of Aunt Abby's saying, Oh, I expect it will all be the same, child, but we don't know what's to be done for certain. And she went on talking to Aunt Emma about some letter she had had from the family. Aunt Emma's going to bring you back again soon, so be a good girl while you're away. So Jenny went back to Putney and tried hard to be a good girl, though it was sometimes difficult. Aunt Emma was patient and kind and talkative as usual, 
But Jenny hated the stuffy little house and the flimsy tables more than ever. The only comfort she got for herself was by going over and over again in her mind the things that had been told to her by Miss Ruby and Black Jack and Miss Primrose and all the rest of them in the old house. I knew it couldn't last forever, she used to tell herself. It was too good to be true, but I wish I could have found Mr. Snatcher. The imaginary Mr. Snatcher, with his bowler hat and bristling black moustache, had always been a favourite of Jenny's, in spite of his terrible outbursts of temper. It seemed a long time to her since she had invented a new punishment for him. A week or so went by, and still she stayed with Aunt Emma. It was exactly four and a half weeks before Jenny was taken back to Aunt Abby's, and it was dusk again when she arrived. When the gates were reached, Jenny dared hardly lift her eyes to look at the windows. They would be all in darkness, she feared. Time and again she had asked Aunt Emma if she knew what was happening at Aunt Abby's, but Aunt Emma had always said she had not heard from Aunt Abby. She followed Aunt Emma inside the gate, turned and carefully fastened the latch, then turned again and looked up. The windows were all in darkness, all but one. Jenny felt a lump in her throat and she had to blink her eyes rapidly to see her way to the door. At first sight, things were not much changed in Aunt Abby's quarters. There were fewer servants, but there were still servants about and Aunt Abby was still in her alpaca dress. Uncle Nickel, of course, was exactly as Jenny had left him, but he looked happier. Not so many of them to fuss around and get in my way, he explained, glancing over the top of his newspaper at the white apron servants who were moving in and out of the kitchen. Uncle Nickel, what's happened? asked Jenny anxiously. Eh? said Uncle Nickel. Ah, yes, my dear, the rest home, or whatever they called it, has been closed down. They've all gone, and one of the family has come back to live here. From scraps of conversation she overheard between Aunt Abby and Aunt Emma, Jenny realised that this was indeed the fact. They had gone. She had lost them all, her friends. That was all she could think of for the moment. But when she lay in bed that night, back in the old nursery with Miss Clare's doll clasped in her arms, she told herself that she hadn't lost every bit of them. I knew them before I found them, she puzzled it out to herself. And I can always have them like I did at first, though it won't be the same now. The next day she stole along the long twisting passage and managed to peep inside some of the rooms. They were empty and silent once more, and some of them were covered all over with dust sheets. One or two, however, were evidently in use, and Jenny remembered the one lighted window she had seen on the previous evening. I suppose that's the room the family uses of an evening, she said to herself. And so she wandered about along the passage and up and down the stairs that day, a little lost and bewildered but going very quietly in case Aunt Abby heard her and took her downstairs to the basement. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of The House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro Chapter 21 the finding of Mr. Snatcher. It was as she was standing by a window at one end of the twisting passage that afternoon that she suddenly made an extraordinary discovery. She was looking down into the garden when she heard the tramp, tramp, of heavy boots coming along the gravel path round the corner of the house. She leaned out. It was the dustman coming to fetch the dustbin which was underneath her window. That's not the dustman who used to come, it's a new one, thought Jenny, and yet I seem to have seen him before. She looked down at the round top of his hat which was smothered in fine dust. 
the dustman called out to one of the servants in a rather irritable voice. Then he looked up, and Jenny saw his face. "'It's Mr. Snatcher,' she gasped in amazement, and pulled her head in, and then put it out again at once as she heard the sound of voices raised in some dispute. One of the servants had come out, and the dustman was speaking to her in a sharp, angry voice. The next minute he burst into a violent temper. He seemed to be enraged at the place where the dustbin was kept, and said they put it there on purpose to give him a lot of trouble. More and more angry he grew, his big black moustache bristling with indignation, until Jenny could have cried with joy. "'Oh, it is Mr. Snatcher! It is Mr. Snatcher!' She was dancing up and down inside the window. "'It's just exactly what he did. I've found him. I've really found him!' And she hung out of the window in rapture. "'Of course, I know why I didn't find him in the house,' she thought. "'I remember now. For his last punishment I had turned him into a dustman. And here he is.' I never thought I might find him like this. Mr. Snatcher's voice was rising higher and higher in his wrath. There were three of the servants outside arguing with him now. It was a wonder Aunt Abby didn't hear, but she was at the front of the house. I ought to invent a punishment for him, of course, said Jenny. She pulled her head in and looked around for an idea. Her wandering eye lighted on a very large brown rug lying on the floor of the corridor. Quick as thought, she picked it up, dragged it to the window, and, heaving it up over the sill, dropped it right on top of Mr. Snatcher's head. His arms shot out and he whirled round, the rug whirling round with him. The three maids began to shriek with laughter at the absurd spectacle. One glance at the tangled mass of rug and Mr. Snatcher, and Jenny flew away to her bedroom and shut the door tight. And there she stayed, not daring to come out again until she was obliged to go down for her tea. Nobody suspected her. She heard the maids still laughing over it, and gathered that they thought the rug had been hanging over the sill to air and had suddenly fallen. From that time on, Jenny meant to keep a watch for Mr. Snatcher. Now she had found him, she did not mean to lose him again. And some day, when he was in a less bad temper than usual, she meant to speak to him. End of chapter 21。Chapter 22 of The House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Caro. Chapter 22. The Real Miss Clare. Jenny, you wanted upstairs in the drawing room, said Aunt Abby that evening. Come here and let me fix your hair ribbon straight. And now come along and be a good girl. Aunt Abby took hold of Jenny's hand and led her solemnly up the stairs to the door of the drawing room, where she tapped on the door. "'Come in,' called a voice. "'I've brought my niece Jenny, miss, as you asked me,' said Aunt Abby, opening the door and pushing Jenny inside the room. Jenny stood nervously inside the door and looked across the big room to where a lady was sitting in a deep armchair beside the fire. The room was gloomy and full of shadows, being lighted by one red-shaded electric lamp, which stood on a table near the hearth. What an enormous room it must be, thought Jenny, to make the lady look so far away. Then Jenny became aware that the door had closed behind her, and that Aunt Abby had gone. She was alone with the strange lady. But was she a stranger? Jenny looked again, and knew she had seen her before. Come here, little girl. Come over to me, said the lady and her voice seemed to come from a great distance. Jenny started obediently to walk toward her. It seemed a very long way across the carpet, but Jenny kept her eyes steadily on the figure in the armchair as she approached. It seemed almost like a dream to Jenny, walking across like this toward the cold-eyed, thin-lipped lady at the other end of the room. 
How well Jenny remembered the face of the lady, the other Miss Clare. She had never expected to see her again. Why had she sent for her, Jenny wondered. Could it be that Miss Clare had seen her throw the mat out of the window on top of Mr Snatcher? Jenny's heart gave a jump, and she paused for a second halfway toward Miss Clare. Miss Clare had not taken her eyes off Jenny since the little girl had entered the room, and as Jenny came to a standstill on the hearthrug before her chair, she said slowly, "'So you are Jenny?' "'Yes, please,' said Jenny. "'And how is Lady Barbara?' said Miss Clare. "'Oh!' exclaimed Jenny. "'I do hope you're not vexed with me.' "'Vexed? Why should I be?' Miss Clare inquired coldly. I found her and she looked lonely, Jenny found herself saying. Miss Clare nodded. I used to take her out just a bit and nurse her, faltered Jenny. And tell her that Miss Clare hadn't forgotten her. I know. But I had, broke in Miss Clare harshly. I had quite forgotten her. Jenny could think of nothing to say. "'That was before I knew you had grown up,' said Jenny presently. "'I know. My old nurse told me,' said Miss Clare. Jenny understood now. That was how Miss Clare knew about her and Lady Barbara. "'I sent for you,' Miss Clare went on, "'because I have heard a lot about you from the various people who have been living in this house.' I suppose you were sorry to come back and find all your friends had gone? Yes, said Jenny faintly. Miss Clare rose to her feet and began to move restlessly about the room. Jenny, she turned suddenly to the little girl on the hearth rug, go upstairs and fetch Lady Barbara down. I want to see her. Jenny obeyed instantly. There was something in Miss Clare's voice that made her do so. She ran quickly upstairs to the old nursery and got Lady Barbara out of the cupboard. "'Oh, my dear, Miss Clare's come. She's come at last, and she wants you. So you see she hasn't forgotten you,' Jenny assured the old doll. In her haste she gathered up with the doll the torn old exercise book in which Miss Clare used to do her lessons. She didn't notice this until she was halfway down the stairs. Miss Clare was seated by the fire when Jenny got back to the drawing room. Jenny carried the doll over to her and placed it on her knee. Miss Clare gazed down in silence at Lady Barbara's face, while Jenny felt a funny lump come into her throat to think that, at last, after all these years, the poor old doll's wish had been granted. She had found Miss Clare again. Whatever Lady Barbara's feelings were, she kept them well under control. Not the slightest sign of any sort did she show, though Jenny used to say afterward that she was sure there were tears in the pathetic eyes that Lady Barbara kept so fixedly staring at the ceiling. And whatever Miss Clare's feelings were, she too kept them well under control. She just stroked Lady Barbara's hair and looked at her in silence. Jenny seemed to be the only one who couldn't manage her feelings. Here were Miss Clare and Lady Barbara behaving in a strictly correct manner. And here was Jenny with a tear rolling slowly down each cheek. She was feeling all that she imagined the other two ought to feel. "'Jenny, why, what's the matter?' inquired Miss Clare sharply, looking up in astonishment at Jenny in tears. "'I'm not crying, really.' said Jenny, at least only a little bit, because, because I was feeling how happy Lady Barbara must be to find you again after all this long, long time. And then something went click in Miss Clare's brain, like a little door opening, and for the first time in thirty years she remembered what it felt like when she was the little girl in the picture hanging upstairs on the wall in the passage. At the same moment, the hard, cold look in Miss Clare's eyes seemed to melt, and with a new, soft expression in them, she looked at Jenny and smiled. 
the old Miss Clare, with the cold eyes, would have said, There, there, my child, dry your eyes and be sensible. But the Miss Clare with the new soft light in her eyes nodded to Jenny, understanding. Then she bent her head down over Lady Barbara as if listening. Do you know what Lady Barbara told me just then? the new Miss Clare asked Jenny as she raised her head. What? said Jenny breathlessly. She's very happy to see me again, she says, but she wants me to give her to you so that you can look after her for me. She says you have been so kind to her. Will you take her, Jenny? She shall belong to both of us if you like, but you shall be the one to take care of her. Oh, Miss Clare, was all Jenny could say as she received Lady Barbara in her willing arms. She dropped the exercise book in her excitement, and Miss Clare picked it up. Why, what's this? she exclaimed, turning over the pages. I found it up in the nursery cupboard. It's yours, said Jenny. And the next minute she found herself sitting on the arm of Miss Clare's chair, telling her all about the discoveries she had made up in the old nursery. Jenny had forgotten all about being shy, forgotten all her disappointment in the old Miss Clare. This Miss Clare she was talking to seemed so different and altogether just like the little girl in the picture would have grown up to be if she had grown up in the right way. And so Jenny chattered away, telling Miss Clare all about the games in the passage and how she used to pretend the Miss Clare in the picture was chasing her. "'I used to play a game something like that,' said Miss Clare, "'only I pretended it was a little old man chasing me because he wanted me to carry a heavy bundle of sticks on my back. Then Jenny told Miss Clare how pleased she was when she found out through the exercise book that Miss Clare didn't know what nine times six were. Miss Clare began to laugh. Do you know, Jenny, I'll tell you a secret, but you must promise not to tell a soul. It's between you and me only. Miss Clare leant forward and whispered, I don't know what nine times six are, even now. Don't tell anyone whatever you do. Jenny promised solemnly, and looking into Miss Clare's twinkling eyes, felt that the secret made them more than friends. Gradually, Jenny told Miss Clare all about her pretending people, and the extraordinary way in which they had seemed to come alive, and what they had told her. And lastly, she confessed about Mr. Snatcher. Miss Clare began to laugh again, and laughed until the tears came into her eyes. "'Oh, Jenny, Jenny,' she said, "'what an odd little girl you are!' And then it was Miss Clare's turn, and she told Jenny all about how, when she had decided to come and live in her old home again, the rest home had been closed down. "'I have had many disappointments in my life,' said Miss Clare and I have grown into the habit of shutting myself up away from people. I wanted to be alone, to be away from everybody. I wanted everything silent and quiet and restful, to forget. I think I wanted to forget even the time when I was happy. I don't know why. But happiness can never be quite forgotten, Jenny. And tonight I have remembered quite a lot of happy things. I have remembered... Miss Clare broke off, and then went on suddenly. Jenny, we'll have all those people, all your friends, back again. What do I want with a great lonely house full of shadows, full of silence? We'll open up all the rooms again, and take all the sheets off the furniture, and have all the lights on. And as if to make a start at once, Miss Clare got up quickly and one after another switched on all the electric lights in the room. Jenny had to blink her eyes, it was so bright. "'We'll ask them all back again,' went on Miss Clare eagerly. "'And we'll invite others as well. We'll fill this gloomy old house with people, and we'll drive all the shadows away. Would you like that, Jenny?' For the life of her, Jenny could not reply. She was too excited. But her eyes and her smile were sufficient answer for Miss Clare. 
it seemed to Jenny too good to be true. "'It seems selfish and wrong to fill up the rooms with shadows,' Miss Clare went on, "'when there are people waiting outside.' And she continued planning with Jenny what she was going to do. They were both so absorbed that they neither of them heard a repeated knocking at the drawing-room door, so that they were surprised to see it slowly open and Aunt Abby appear. "'Oh, excuse me, Miss Clare,' she said, "'only it was getting so late, and I thought Jenny might be bothering you.' "'Bothering me? Bothering me? Do you hear that, Jenny?' Miss Clare laughed happily. Aunt Abby was surprised to hear Miss Clare laugh. But the next second her surprise deepened into sheer amazement as Miss Clare stooped, put her arms round Jenny, and kissed her. End of chapter 22 End of the House with the Twisting Passage by Marion St. John Webb Recording by Carew